Welcome to the Virtual Stab Comedy Theater. It's time for the Suzette Bonetti Show. Please welcome to your screen, Suzette Bonetti. Hey everybody, how are you? Uh, it's 5.08. It is October, oh, it's October 11th. It, it's National Coming Out Day. So um, if you are out there and you're watching and you need to come out or you'd like to come out or you wanna come out, um, today's a great day for it and there are people that will love you. Um, also, oh my God, so close to voting time. So please, um, whoever you are and wherever you are, make sure you're voting. Um, Mail-in voting has already started and in-person voting is right around the corner. Oh, that was a big deep sigh because we all need to vote. Okay, cool. Um, let's see. I'm gonna start the show with a monologue like normal, but first I wanna say um, congratulations to a woman in Chicago. I should get her name before I say this. She was going to take the bar exam um, to be an attorney and she was taking the bar exam um, and then she went into labor in the middle of the bar exam, in the middle of the pandemic, in the middle of 2020. So there's probably just a better time to do that, but she rocked all of it and she finished the bar exam. I don't know how, um, and she gave birth. I also don't know how, haven't done that one yet. Um, also haven't taken a bar exam, uh, but she did it. Her name's Brianna Hill. Uh, she's a recent graduate of Loyola University School of Law in Chicago. And um, because of the pandemic, her bar exam was pushed um, and Wow, ma'am, congratulations for everything. That's amazing. Oh my God, I'm like, wow. Okay, cool. Um, also, I think, and we'll talk with Chelsea about this, but I think it's really um, cool what Bill Burr uh, just did um, on Saturday Night Live. And he got a lot of flack for it, but it is a comedian's job. Um, and I think a drag queen's job, to, and I've talked about this on my show with people, to push the boundaries um, and make you say, huh, I don't know if I agree with that, but it's making me think about it. And sometimes you'll laugh and sometimes you'll cheer, um, but either way, um, you're always going to say, huh, that's making me think about things. Um, and that's what he did on Saturday Night Live. So I think it was actually a good set. And I don't know if anyone watches that show and this show, I'm not sure what the Venn diagram is, um, but I'm a fan of it. And I'm sorry if you're not. Um, he made some good points. <laughs> and um, that's a comic's job. So um, now I'm gonna get to jokes. Sorry. Um, it's weird being back in studio, but here we are. Um, okay. Amidst everything going on with the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, and the global pandemic, Kentucky Fried Chicken is temporarily dropping their famous slogan, finger licking good, because you aren't supposed to touch your face during the pandemic. Um, so they're saying, don't put your fingers in your mouth. So eat your fried chicken, you know, like a normal person does with a fork and knife. Or just wash your fucking hands. How about that? How about we all just wash our hands and then we can eat chicken with our hands? Because that's the way it's supposed to be eaten. Um, and KFC shouldn't have to tell people not to. Like, just wash your hands before you eat chicken. <clears throat> Sylvain Elan, 35-year-old uh, gentleman, uh, a French kindergarten teacher, um, who's covered from head to toe in tattoos, including his tongue, and now having the whites of his eyes surgically made black, has been informed that he can no longer teach kindergarten after the school received complaints from parents about how Elan's appearance scared the children. Yeah. He's covered in tattoos from head to toe, and he he's has his eyes are surgically blackened, so it might be scary to children. Um, he commented that he hopes in the future adults can be less homophobic and racist. I'm not sure he's using those uh, fears correctly, um, but that's what he's hoping for. Okay. 
uh, Saturday Night Live dropped Morgan Wallen as a musical guest for last night's show. Um, they said it was because of the COVID protocols being broken, but maybe it's because no one knows who Morgan Wallen is. I mean, I'm sure some people do, but like some people know who I am. And if Saturday Night Live booked me to host the show and then realized that like n not many people know who I am and then Reese Witherspoon was available, I'd go with Reese Witherspoon. That's all I'm saying. Also, it's been in the news. Uh, it's been reported that SNL is paying its audience members uh, $150 per episode. And while that isn't normal for SNL to do in its past, it's actually a very normal practice for shows to pay an audience or select them through a casting process. Um, lots of shows do it. Uh, like all the game shows, like um, Price is Right, that's through a casting process. Sorry to burst your bubble. Um, it's just not shows that don't usually have to, like Saturday Night Live or shows that can't afford to, like the Suzette Venetti show. Um, by the way, you can send some coin to Stab Comedy Theater because this show's brought to you for free. Um, so right above my head, that's where it is. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Carol Baskin last week was finally eliminated from Dancing with the Stars after a samba to Circle of Life. Okay, first of all, sambas are hard. I don't know why they had that lady try a samba. Um, a samba to the circle of life. The judges struggled to find positive things to say before scoring her low enough to send her home. Most people would be frustrated and looking to lash out. Um, but in a quote, she seemed not to understand the optics of uh, how she, what she said when she was asked how she felt. Because um, she said, my husband is going to be happy I'm coming home. And I was like, uh-oh. Will your husband be happy you're coming home? Your husband? Your current one? Is going to be happy? Because you had a bad time? I don't think he will be. <clears throat> Mitch McConnell refused to debate his opponent in the upcoming... Uh, refused to debate um, in a debate his opponent... I'm going to start over on that. Wow. Suzette, practice. Mitch McConnell refused to participate in a debate in the upcoming debate for his Senate seat... Um, if the m debate moderator was a woman. Um, I don't know if Mitch McConnell is the adult that Sylvain Alon was talking about. Um, do we have sympathy for McConnell after seeing Mike Pence debate Kamala Harris? Um, is it uh, because McConnell looks like he's been around since slavery and since the suffragettes, so it looks like he, like he feels like people might blame him internally for that? Um, and he knows better, or maybe he just doesn't want to, the, the moderator was a black woman. Maybe he just doesn't want to be an idiot in front of a black woman. Um, cause we all saw Mike Pence do it and you shouldn't do it. Uh, get out, leave. It's the end of you and me. I can't wait for you to be gone. Those are all lyrics to the Jojo song from 2004 and also things that would have been acceptable for Donald Trump to say when they asked him to denounce white supremacy. Once again, it was get out, leave, it's the end of you and me. Uh, instead, he said, stand back and stand by. <clears throat> Guys, I just want to point out that a 14-year-old girl in 2004 is better at saying goodbye to a toxic partner than the current president of the United States. And it's a catchy song, right? A five-year-old boy named Carver in Oregon sent firefighters a baby Yoda to brighten their spirits when they fought the forest fires. Um, it's like, why does that five-year-old boy care more about the firefighters than the president? Right. <laughs> the Proud Boys are getting trolled on Twitter by gay men for taking, because the gay men are t have taken over Proud Boys. This is amazing. Um, and uh, so now the Proud Boys, in a move that is confusing everybody, um, they're changing their hashtag to Leathermen. Now, they're going to be really disappointed uh, when they find out that um, because that's a whole different group um, that already exists. And that group's probably also going to dominate that hashtag. Uh, so I did some scooping, and I already know the next chosen hashtag of the Proud Boys or the white nationalists. It's confusing again, but they're going with bears and bottoms. They clearly don't understand what they're up against. 
Okay. Uh, sorry. Just doing a show thing here. Look, the Chromebook. It's back. Okay. Um, it's been reported that Trump only spent two hours preparing for the presidential debate against Joe Biden. That's obvious from his performance. Uh, but actually, two hours is almost as much time as he spent dodging questions and interrupting the moderator and Joe Biden. So I think he did that for about two hours and two minutes and 37 seconds. Because of Trump testing positive for COVID-19, the second presidential debate has been scheduled for a virtual debate. Currently, Trump is refusing to participate, but again, it looked like he refused to participate in the last debate, uh, even though he showed up. So, like, what's the difference? Speaking of debates, uh, every woman everywhere felt all sorts of feelings, uh, while Vice President Mike Pence, clearly unaware of the optics uh, of, I don't know, life and, well, everything, talked over Harris and moderator Susan Page. Um, things really became ridiculous when Mike Pence asked uh, Susan Page to grab him some coffee and told Kamala Harris to smile more. Speaking of Kamala Harris, um, <clears throat> she was smiling that, boy, I wish you would smile at Mike Pence. Um, and that would have been the takeaway from the vice presidential debate. Uh, but Mike Pence was upstaged by a fly. Um, and uh, it was so obvious because he has really white hair and that fly was so clearly there. I don't know how he didn't feel it. Anyway, um, I can't make jokes that haven't already been made about that because everyone's made them and they've all been good. And I'll just be a hack to make more jokes on top of it. Um, but big props to uh, Joe Biden's team for coming out with fly swatters so quickly. Oh, okay. It paid off, you guys. Um, do we have anyone in the... Do we have the fly? Okay. Guys, we have the fly um, for interview. So um, welcome to... The Suzette Venetti Show, The Fly. Is he in the Zoom? Oh. Hello, Fly, are you there? Hello? Hi there. Hi. What, what's your name? Hi, thank, thank you for having me, Suzette. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. You're quite a celebrity right now. Oh, 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 no, no, no. No, I don't think so. No? Well, you made quite a stir on the national scene. Yeah, 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 yeah. I suppose I did. Well, so... Let's let's start with the first thing. What's your name? Oh, my 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 name my name is is Brian McFly. Brian McFly. Okay. And were you aware that what you were doing was going to be such a sensation? Oh, oh no, 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 you know. Um you know, fly flies just um fly flies just do what we do. We we love horse shit, so I was just flying around and you know, you know the rest. I do. Um, so then you're saying you love to land on shit. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Most of the time. Yeah, that's what I try to do. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about the merchandise being produced? Uh, I Not with your likeness, but because of you. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a little shy, so it's, uh, you know, uh, now, now I'm kind of everywhere. But, um, you know, I, I think... I think it's I think it's funny. I think you know, um, pr pretty fly for a white guy is is funny because because I'm a fly and um, and and you know Mike Pence is not an attractive man, so it's a, it's funny, you know. Okay. Um, do you have like a fly family that you'd like some of the money from the merchandise for, or like do you want some of a cut from it at all? Like maybe to like 
save up to like start fly dating or something? Oh yeah, yeah, no, no, it's 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 uh it's it's actually it's it's been great cuz um you, you know, I don't I don't actually get get out much for a fly um but uh you know, now now this this last week um you you know, some some several nice females have approached me and um you, you know, I think we're expecting our um 10,000th child uh, tonight, so that's that's real nice. What is the lifespan of a fly? Oh well, you, yeah, it de- de- depends de- depends on on the fly, you know. <laughs> uh, da- dangerous life, you know, being a fly. Um, sometimes uh, people always people always trying to you know swat at you, and um, animals trying to swat at you, and uh, I got chased by by a really big cat today. That was pretty scary. Um, but you know, I'm I'm going on uh, going on about two weeks now, so we got a pretty good run going. So, are you planning on attending the next debate? Uh, um, well, well, you know, I this, uh, I, it, maybe if I make it that that long, I guess to to, to finish answering your, your previous question, I'm just. I'm hoping I'm hoping for one more good week, you know, just uh, that'd be great. That would be that'd be fantastic. Okay, so you might make like, I don't know, maybe the presidential debate. You could appear there. Oh, well, you you know, I'm a I'm I'm a, I'm a fly, so I can't I can't read. But if if I'm around, um, yeah, you know, we like like I said, we we, we love that horse shit. So we're always <laughs> always in the mood for a debate. Right on. Um, do you have any political leanings, Brian McFly? Oh, oh yeah, I, uh, I, I, um, I, um, yeah, I mean, you know, since, since I was, since, since I'm, I'm, you know, pushing two weeks old, I've, I've learned a lot. Um, I don't think I'm, I'm going to make it to, uh, to the, to, um, I don't think I'm going to make it to the vote. So, uh. You know, maybe one of my kids will be able to vote in the election, but um, you know, just uh, just kind of riding the wave, you know. Right on. Is there anything that you'd like to tell the public? Oh, oh yeah. I, I mean, I just this is a, a good time. Um, just it, but you know, the next time you you see a fly, um, that that could you know that could be me. So just don't just like don't hit any flies for a little while, and I'd appreciate it. I will remember that. I will not hit a fly for you, Brian. Um, thank you for coming on the show. I know you must be in hot demand on the talk show circuit, and uh, we're very lucky to have had you today. Oh, oh yeah, thanks. Thank, thanks, Suzette. Yeah, I have, a, I have a few more shows this week, so um, I hope the rest of yours goes well. Thank you. Thank you, and I hope um, the rest of yours do as well. Take care. Okay, everybody, that was uh, Brian McFly, the famous fly from the vice presidential uh, debate. And next, uh, we're going to bring on uh, Chelsea Bierce, uh, but not alone. Uh, She will be joined um, by Heather Weber, who uh, we've had her husband on the show, and then Chelsea's her best friend. So it feels like we've had Heather on the show already. Um, so please join me in welcoming uh, Chelsea and Heather. Hey guys! Oh, I'm okay. unmuted. Oh my god! Yes! Yes! Oh my god! This is <laughs> exciting. Wow! That was a lot. That was a lot. We figured it out. Yes, we oh, got there. Rob's on here too. Is that what I see? <laughs> we have everybody on here. You know, the secret of the show is I can't really see what's happening. So. I know. <laughs> You're doing great, buddy. I love you, Jesse. Um, are we? On oh, here? there we go. No. We figured it out. We got it. It's just the two of us now. Okay, cool. So, um, how are you guys doing, first of all? Peachy. Oh, so good. So good. So far, so good. But it's early. No, Robbie, you're not on here yet. 
you mute. You mute. You're not on here yet. Oh, no one told me fucking anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, just to, to, to be fair, secret Robbie guest, uh, I did say we were bringing on Chelsea and Heather, and your name's Robbie. <laughs> so wow. I didn't. We didn't tell you anything, but like we kind of told you by. To be fair, to be fair, you guys, Suzette does not know how to throw shade. Okay, she doesn't know how. She did not go to class for that. I didn't. She doesn't know how to throw shade. Okay, she that, failed. That was, and that's just how it is. I was just trying to be nice to a person that I want to be nice to. <laughs> I can throw shade. She's feeling good about herself. She just got the fly on her show. So I know, that's true. Yeah. And it's pretty amazing you got a fly on your show since their lifespan is like three days. So like like they spent literally a huge part of their life on your show right now. So congratulations That's to you. I know. He should be like having babies or eating or doing whatever flies do. Um, and I he, mean, he spent relax. like This was their foreplay. I, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, no thing, there's no telling that the fly wasn't doing all of that during the show anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I... So speaking of foreplay and dating um i actually wanted to ask you heather about you're married to a stand-up comedian i am tell me about that yeah what nightmare is that that you're living <laughs> um you know i mean it's the, the the cliche there's never a dull moment but um no i thoroughly enjoy it it is uh it's something very different but i think like if you're gonna be with a stand-up comic you have to feel confident in yourself and not try and steal the spotlight from them and also understand the dynamic. Um, also understand the comedy world. If you don't understand how the entertainment world works, then you're going to feel very left out. So. so what do you mean by that? Like what, 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 if somebody, let's say somebody's watching and they want to date a stand-up comedian, what should they understand about the stand-up comedy world? Um, I mean, you have to understand that uh, they're going to do some crazy stuff for stage time. Uh, they're going to drive a couple hours for little to no money, and you have to be okay with that. Uh, you have to be okay and trusting with them coming in at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning and know that all they were really doing was they were on stage. They weren't doing anything else. Where I feel like in any other uh, world, if your significant other is coming home at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're going to question some things. So you have to be comfortable and trusting with the person that you're with. That's all they're doing. And can, I, I think it's kind of relevant, um, if you don't mind me asking, so you can tell the audience, what do you do for a living? Um, I do a shitload of things. <laughs> I'm a, a massage therapist, a strength and conditioning coach, and a nutritionist. Okay. That is a lot of things. So <laughs> none of she's those. Thin, okay, she's fucking thin. That's what she does for a living. <laughs> she's thin. Get she gets paid to be thin. Um, <laughs> I would like that job, please. I, I mean, I first need to be thin, but then I'd like to. Uh, can I? Do you have to be thin first, or can you, like can you get paid and then become thin? Absolutely not. The whole reason that I even got into the world that I'm in is because I was overweight as a kid. Um, and as a teenager. And so that really opened my eyes to things and how the world works. And I think also, like, if you've gone through that, people are more apt to trust you and confide in you and things instead of just like, oh, you've been thin your whole life, which hasn't been the case. So. Okay. Well, I would like that job because I want to be thin and get money. So, um, so what I was going to, with my, what I was trying to get at was you don't, your job's, requires some creativity but mm -hmm. but you're not a performer um so do you think that makes it harder or easier for you to date a performer i mean ours is a weird dynamic because i do understand the comedy world probably too much uh that i actually enjoy writing and i enjoy going to comedy shows which i know is a weird thing for significant others but not everybody does that um, so I'm kind of the weird one of the bunch. Um, but I think you at least have to be respectful of it and you have to at least know enough 
to understand what they're doing, why they're doing it. Like, I think it's unnerving at some point how much my husband enjoys politics. I shouldn't say enjoys, is enthralled with politics, but I also understand that with comedy, you have to be in the know of celebrity and politics and all this different shit. And I don't enjoy it as much, but I respect that he has to be a part of it to talk about it on stage. Okay, interesting. Can I, can I interject here for a second and just say... Nothing has Heather ever stopped you from interjecting before. Why would you ask now? Up, Shut the fuck up, Shut the fuck up. So, uh... Heather is one of the rare breeds, okay? I have dated uh, while being a stand-up comic. This is my 13th year. I've been doing stand-up comedy as long as her husband has, Miles Weber, when we go on the road a lot together, which a lot of people, if I'm going to make a little segue here, a lot of people would not be okay with their male husband, straight comedian husband, going traveling with a big-breasted, light-skinned black girl doing dick jokes for comedy like it's just she, like she's so secure in who she is who he is and who they are as a couple but she also knows me very well like i see i there's nothing threatening when it comes to their relationship and me just doing my job next to her husband but there is there, a, a lot of people have insecurities that just pop up when you're dating a stand-up comic. So Heather had to kind of endure all of these, but it just shows her caliber of person that she's okay with her husband being this on stage, in front of the camera, under the lights, in front of the audience kind of personality. Because yeah. stand-up comics, we are it's all about us like, yeah. like we like yeah. the and you, you have to be okay with that if you want to try and intervene in the spotlight it's probably not the relationship for you we're like just the other night miles was texting me and he was like oh yeah so and so's friend was there and they brought a porn star and most people would be like you hung out with a porn star all night and i'm like great cool and then we just moved on and it just was what it was right I've had I've had significant others who have gotten mad because jokes that I've told have been about previous relationships or boyfriends that I've had and they're like why are you telling those jokes you need to cut those out and they've gotten jealous about jokes that I've told about people that are no longer in my life and they've wanted me to cut those out you know so it's like you have to have a level of security like self worth you know yeah. you have to have that level if you want to date someone because there's something very attractive about someone on stage that has confidence enough to tell jokes to an arena that's mm -hmm. very very attractive but then oh, yeah. when you break it down and you want to get to know them on a on a like personal level that's a completely different aspect it's yeah. very very different to know them on that level one-on-one -on -one, as opposed to one to 200. Yeah, well, because what you get on stage and what you get one-to-one -one is never going to be the same person. Doesn't right. matter if they're staying true to themselves or not, they're still gonna turn themselves up to a level. So they're never right. gonna be what you see on stage. Exactly, and Heather's seen that from Miles, her husband, but also from me. She's, she talks to me, I talk to Heather every single day of my life. And so it's like, she knows me on a personal level I can get vulnerable with her. I can get like open with her. I can get, you know, vulnerable, sad, all this stuff with her. But she knows who I am when I'm a comedian and I'm on stage for those 20 minutes. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it's a, it's different. It's the same me. I'm me. I'm very true to who I am on stage, but it's a heightened version. Yeah. I forgot um, who the quote was that Miles would talk about, but he would say that uh, I can talk to none of you and I can talk to all of you all at the same time. And I feel like that was the biggest thing in comedy is that you can talk to people as a collective group, but if it's one-on-one, yeah. -on -one, it's such a different social interaction for comics. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's true. And I, I've actually, I have that where, um, where it's, it's very comfortable for me to 
talk to a, an entire audience of people. You put me in front of a people of a, a group of a hundred and a microphone, I'm I'm okay. I'm comfortable. You put me in a room one on one with somebody, and that it terrifies me. It's weird. I'm 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 weirdly like socially ah. So is Suzette gone? Is the show over now? What what the fuck is this? Where this is day, Suzette? We're taking over, bitch. No, I'm here. That's it. I'm here. Yeah, it's it. <laughs> okay. I was canceled by the network. They like you guys more. Um. <laughs> They have taste. That's good. Oh, no. Jesse's doing me a favor, and, and he had to switch the camera around. So we're all still here. Oh. Um, uh, I, I've asked a lot of him today. Um, so, okay, question. Um, I want to go back to something you said, um, Chelsea. Uh, so you pointed out that because Heather knows you, um, it's easier for her to trust Miles. But I would actually want to ask Heather... Um, I feel like you'd trust Miles whether it was Chelsea or not on the road with mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I I trust Miles with anybody. Um, but and I think that goes back to what I said earlier where you just have to be confident in yourself. And uh, I kind of know I'm great. And I bring a lot of great things to the table. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, okay. I don't, I'm not intimidated. <laughs> and, you know, I also know that, like, you know, comics are just – different so uh you just have to work around that a little bit that's so, true and so, i i've i've seen i've seen miles on the road with m multiple people you know like we have a, a a thread between the three of us on marco polo i know that he reaches out to heather after every show that he does he he keeps in in contact with us when he's on the road so that we know where he is you know he's just but that's also, that's not speaking to his caliber as a comedian. That's speaking to his caliber as a person. Mm -hmm. You know, like him and Heather have worked so hard on their relationship. They are stronger than they ever have been. Like, like this year has really, really um, tested them in yeah. ways that they didn't know that their relationship would be tested. And it is, uh, it's incredible to see where their relationship was struggling, but not only that, but to see how they've overcome that is huge, is absolutely huge. And it's beautiful to see. So, I mean, they, you have to be secure, not only as yourself, but in the relationship that mm -hmm. you're in, if you're going to be dating someone that's in the entertainment field. Yeah. I mean, it's well, a lot. And, and what made us so strong this year, you know, because we've been together for almost eight years. We were friends for three years before that. Um, so we've known each other for almost 11 years, which is crazy to say. Um, but in all of that, this is the first year being locked in together for six months, like consecutively. That's the longest we've ever been around each other. For the seven years leading up to this, the longest we saw each other was three weeks at a time. So mm -hmm. to actually be in with each other for six months, we actually discovered like, hey, you're a really great person, like more than I already knew. Yeah. Um, but to say that to somebody, if they are talking to a comedian, that's going to be an extended period of time that you're not going to see them. And so it really comes down to communication. You both have to have a foundation of communication where you talk to each other before shows, after shows, when you wake up, when you go to sleep, um, and just kind of fill that the best you can. Because, yeah, we went, you know, years without seeing each other. So really this year we, just, we really discovered our relationship, I'd say, this year. So... I always think that people with a pug um, are going to make it. I think that has a big reason to do with it. Um, but uh, you made some other valid reasons like working hard and spending time and getting to know each other. So maybe you're an expert on dating a comedian? I'd say I'm pretty close. <laughs> I'm pretty damn good at it, honestly. Um, but also, I've just I've talked to a lot of a lot of a lot of other comics came to us this year because we did have some ups and downs, and people really did say like, "Hey, we're struggling in this. Can you help us out?" So it's it's more common than people realize. In and that that's not just in comedy. That's in any entertainment industry. 
Because if you think about people that do movies or theater or anything like that, they're gone for extended periods during the day. They're doing tours. So it's anything in the entertainment industry. So you you have to really confide in each other. And whether it's, hey, I'm going to set my alarm 10 minutes early or 15 minutes early so I can talk to you in the morning, or I'm going to stay up a little bit later and talk to you at night, like whatever that is, you guys have to find that communication and really come together on, hey, how are we going to make this work and how are we going to see each other if it's only an hour or two during the day or during FaceTime, so. Right. And as someone who has a musical theater, theater sketch, improv, and stand-up background, uh, I can uh, attest to, you know, I've had exes that have been completely jealous of the fact that sometimes I will have to uh, kiss somebody on stage, and I've had people that are not okay with that. And I'm like, this is, you You, you have to be okay in who mm -hmm. we are as a couple to let you, like, you have to know that right now what I'm doing is work. I'm yeah. a character, I, I'm playing a part, I'm relaying a story that's not necessarily my own, and then I'll leave, I'll wipe the makeup off, I'll take the costume off, and then I'll come home to you and I'll be me. You know, and so there is, there, there's a level of performance that you have to separate from reality. Mm -hmm. And some people are not, okay with that at all you know and so it's just it's a really fine line but it also yeah. really tests your self-worth and and your confidence in yourself your self-confidence has yeah. to be strong enough to date someone that's in the limelight yeah and you also have to be open to that no matter which area they're in in entertainment because the first six months i was with miles he did a sitcom sketch and he had a sex scene with another woman and that was our first six months together and that was i was signing up for comedy i wasn't signing up for acting but it all blends together and you never know where somebody's gonna go so you also have to keep that in mind that just because you're signing up for this one thing they may get offers later on down the line to go into something else. So they may have another significant other in that, and you have to be okay with that. Right. So, right. Heather, what what could Chelsea do? Like, because if I feel like she's doing everything that she can do, but she's talked about her dating woes on the show before. I mean, she's been turned down for eggs, like a guy made, making making eggs, which is dumb. I mean, look at Chelsea. Look at Chelsea. Look at I'm Chelsea. Robbie, like, like, Chelsea I'm is. The eggs. I don't you know care. I, I don't care what kind of eggs they are. I don't care egg. what you're eating. It could be like you could be getting gumbo, and and <laughs> beignets in New Orleans. You don't pass up Chelsea beers. So like, what could she do? That she's not because you're the expert. Oh, I don't think there's Jesus Christ. I don't think there's anything that she can do that she's not already doing. I just think. I've talked to a lot of people just dating during a pandemic right now is fucking hard. <laughs> like it's people are locked in and a lot of people are already socially awkward. I think that's also what people don't understand is just a lot of people are socially awkward because of technology in general. And so now you're adding six to eight months of being locked down and now they're in front of somebody face to face. It might just be, Hey, I wanted to get out and not, Hey, I'm trying to find love. Um, because Chelsea's one of my favorite people in the world, and I am more than happy to check her when she needs to be checked. And I just think right now, it's just a hard time to be dating. This yeah, is, it's a fucking nightmare. <laughs> it's, yeah, no, dating dating is, okay, so right now it's hard to date. Um, yeah. I'm dating actually- Dating anyway is hard. Let's all be honest. Dating anyway is uh, hard. Yes, and as that. you get older in life, uh -huh. Dating gets harder and harder and harder because your shit becomes thicker and thicker and thicker, and now you're bringing someone in who can in, like integrate that shit into their own shit. So dating as you're go you get further in life is harder and harder yeah. and harder to do. And well, I'm losing a lot of hope. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I will say about Chelsea and what I've known just from the exes that I've met of Chelsea's, um, which is some doozies. Um, Chelsea is a big personality, and I think we can all agree on that. A She's lot. a very big personality. And so I think if somebody's coming in trying to compete with that personality, it's not going to work. 
I think whoever comes into her life has to respect that she's doing a shitload of things. She does comedy. She does theater. She's a mom. She bakes. She has a game show that's coming uh, that has the second episode tomorrow. So <laughs> I mean, got you, boo. Um, Who writes so those she's lines? Doing a shitload <laughs> of things. So somebody, when they come in, they can't be like, oh, it's a competition. They have to respect it and figure out where they fit. And if they don't fit, we're on to the next. I think the problem has been trying to cram people to make it fit when they just don't fit. Yeah, it's true. This is something that we could dive into a lot more um, and a lot deeper because I was going to, like, I'm not as many wonderful things as Chelsea, but I have things going on and I try to cook for myself. Um, so, but what I'm saying is I'm terrible at dating. And um, if you can help me, that'd be cool. <laughs> Let's do this it. Let's do a you. whole episode no. where no. we build dating profiles. Okay. I think okay. that would be a new segment. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, but not just about Suzette because she's boring as fuck. But no, if I you feel like... Like... no, it's fine. I can say that. It's out of love, Suzette, you're boring. So we need Heather to like, you know, beef up our fucking profiles. That'd be so great as a segment. We just bring somebody on and just review the messages they Because that's the other thing is what's the first message you're getting on your dating profile? I think that says a lot about what dick. they're seeing on your profile. I know. I you know that I just get I, I've actually thought about this because I am on a few dating profiles right now. And anyone that reaches out to me, my first, like, message back to them is very thought out. There has to be a little bit of competition in there. There has to be a little bit of an insult. There has to be a little bit of intrigue. Like, I mean, if you can't handle a little bit of an insult and me just, like, flicking you in the balls for a second, then fuck all the way off. I can't deal with you. I for Chelsea, absolutely. And we've actually talked about when she goes on first dates, if she can just bring them to me and Miles and we'll just kind of interview them and we can just kind of, we can save her a lot of time. No, Suzette, do you know this? Miles and Heather have chosen how I should be asked to be married. They've chosen my proposal story. We don't know who's doing it, but we got the engagement story down. They have the whole fucking story. I don't know it. I don't know it. You're not supposed to. I, you know what? I'm actually going to go the other way that I was feeling and say, I think this is healthy. I think it's very healthy that your friends have chosen your engagement. Um, because <laughs> as amazing as you are, you're getting biological fluid in the mail. Um, I did get that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what's happening. There's, it's like, Robbie has, I, you're, you're spilling so much tea right now. I have to update Robbie on so much shit right now. He's losing it right now in the Zoom. We should end this segment just okay. so you can bring Rob. All right. Through. I'm going to say, um, ladies, Heather, Chelsea, if we can come back together, the three of us, and um, Heather can help. Absolutely. What? Absolutely. Of course. Okay. Well, I look, you just said, <laughs> you just said Suzette's boring. No one's as much as boring as Suzette. Um, and that was last week's episode. I'm not lying. No, I, I always tell the truth. Suzette, oh. you're boring as fuck. I love you with every ounce of my soul. But uh -huh. yes, bring me and Heather on to save your goddamn show. I am alt-rock today. I am not boring. <laughs> well, we can't see that because your camera still isn't on. <laughs> so How convenient. How fucking convenient is that? Well, you can, you'll have to watch the episode. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Yeah, so no let's... Problem. Let's the three of us do this again. Um, we'll schedule it. Yeah. We'll make it happen. Done. We'll come up with a name. Um, and I'm going to outro by saying um, we all, the three of us, referenced your new game show um, called Who Wrote This Shit. Second episode is airing tomorrow. Um, and so that's tomorrow. where we're tomorrow at 6 Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Okay. And I'm going to have you stop because we're going to go with the next person. We're going to go with Robbie because we've talked about Robbie and the audience is like, who the fuck is Robbie? Is he dating Suzette? Is he dating Chelsea? Get ready. Buckle up, bitches. Buckle up. Well, if you're saying buckle up, bitches, then everyone should really <laughs> buckle up. Heather, thank you for coming on. Chelsea, of thank you as always. Thank you for having me.
I love you, um, and I can't look. I can't wait. I look forward to having you both again, and I can't wait. And uh, we'll talk soon. Yes. Okay. Bye. 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 Not not yet. <laughs> not yet, hun. Oh, no. I have, I have to intro you. Um, <laughs> so, um, and I didn't get my producer uh, your name. I suck today, um, but. Uh, bringing on the next guest, the producer, and not co-host, but one of the panelists on who wrote this shit. Please, uh, peers and queers, give it up for Robbie Robbie Sandler. Hi. Hi, how are you? I'm here for real. You are here. Um, I'm great. You know, I'm here, I'm queer, I'm available with five minutes notice. You Very are. in demand. I Look, you can't see my in-studio guest, but what what do you think? It's It's a drag queen. Here and queer and available in five minutes notice. Is that amazing? Oh, sir, you're the perfect man, Ooh. Robbie. I'm uh, the perfect what? You're the perfect man. Oh, thank you. Um, so what is Who Wrote This Shit? So Who Wrote This Shit is a game that started in Chelsea's living room in Washington Heights back in 2010. And we would all sit around and we would just announce a category like change a letter, ruin a movie, or terrible sequels to a movie. I, <laughs> they weren't all movie categories, but two of them were, and I've named them. You have. And well we, would, we would all just write down our funniest answers and take turns reading them out and then guessing who wrote this shit. So then... Um, Chelsea and I, of course, reconnected during Corona times because she and I now live as close to one another as I do to anyone else because we're all Zooming. So we reconnected. We started talking. She actually invited me on another fun local game show. We got to be on Eerie Diamond's Match Game Apocalypse together, and we had a party. Uh, it was actually the first time I got to perform with Heather's husband, Miles, too. Um, through that show. So I got to spend a little time there, got invited, got to be a panelist, had so much fun playing with Chelsea. And we talked and we were like, oh my God, we should totally make a game show, but what should it be? And then we realized we'd already been playing it for a decade. We were ready, we had categories. And so we reached out to all of our friends who had been playing it. And from the circle of original players, we found our composer who did the theme song, Lizzie Hagstead, and Jama McMahon at Jama Heart Art, who did our logo and our set design, which let's be honest, is a graphic. And, um, and then of course the composer's roommate, Trevor, who's another good friend of ours and plays with us every week, animated the opening. And before we knew it, it looked like a TV show, but it felt like a game night in our apartment that just happened to have contestants competing for nothing, but like a fancy <laughs> fun nothing. Okay. I am excited. Yeah. I watched the first episode, and I have to say, um, if you can just do a checklist with me here. Um, so uh -huh. you're good friends with someone I love named Chelsea Beers. I am. And your show also has Miles Weber on it, who I adore. Our show has had Miles Weber on it, yes. And your show has my one of my favorite drag queens and people, Apple Adams. Oh my God, I had never met her until we started doing this. And I'm not gonna call it a love affair because that would bring me up to three at once and I feel like that's greedy. But it's definitely hardcore fandom and if it turns into something bigger and better, then it does. Well, um, so those three, and then you're Jewish. I, yes. Well, this is a very, I, this is a very Jewish friendly show. We're not kosher. Oh we're not, I, we're I not want kosher, you to know but like, like, so you're Jewish. This is not a Jewish friendly show. No, this is. I was so nervous. Oh my I God. I thought it no. was going to be like the Mortimer club on the golden girls. Oh baby. You don't know. We'll talk later. Oh. This is, look, I love the Jews and your unleavened bread. Um, so you're in good company. Um, 
so okay, you're f you you do your show with three of my favorite people. You're Jewish. Um, yeah, I think I think you should come. These are some facts. These I that's what I do. I spit facts sometimes, like well, rhymes, I'm and then I try to like rap, but I don't have any street cred, so they tell me to stop. Suzette, stop. Oh no! I know. Were you raised on an avenue? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I think I was. Um, so, also, oh, go ahead. I will say it's funny that you should dwell on the Jewish thing because when I'm not producing a game show, which ooh, when I say it like that just sounds like a Jewish thing to do, it does, but it does. producing a game show is just a thing to do. Uh, but after I'm your bar mitzvah, you have to. I never had a bar mitzvah, so I can do whatever I want. I um, <laughs> And so what I wanted to do was take a set of graphic novels that I found and start adapting them into a musical, which I've been doing with Lizzie, the composer from Who Wrote This Shit. She's also the composer to Hearville, based on the graphic novels by Barry Deutsch. And we're writing a musical about an 11-year-old Orthodox Jewish girl who has a hard time adjusting to her newly blended family, misses her recently deceased mother, and gets comically caught up in the occult, which is funny until it isn't, and ultimately learns to call her stepmother mom. It is a hyper-feminist, all-girl Jewish fantasy. And I think the world needs that yesterday, maybe even the day before. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I'm in the bookstore and I hear a little girl saying to her mom, I need a hyper-feminist Jewish girl fantasy. So I think... It's just one of those things like Manic Pixie Dream Girl that just trips off the tongue. Children are saying it everywhere. Oh, they I might have to rename TikTok. Yeah, I can identify with Manic Pixie Dream Girl. I'm kind of... That's me. That's my that's my aesthetic. Um, so, I okay. appreciate that. I, the closest thing I can come to that is identifying with man, me, Patinkin. <laughs> so okay. So the other the I remember the other thing I was going to say. We have a resident Jew on the show, and I believe you did Erie's match game show with him. Um, mm -hmm. So I I don't know if you remember, um, but maybe you should come back and we can replace him because I don't like him. Okay, cool. Oh, so it's so David, it's yeah. it's yeah. a very Jew friendly show. But of the two we've discussed, one of whom is me. You don't like the other one, so I'm going to say don't. you're fifty fifty on Jews at the moment. No, but he's... I want to believe that you're. <laughs> he, no, I'm a hundred percent. I'm a hundred percent in. I was married. It was it was a Jewish ceremony. Um, I was divorced. Oh, it was a Jewish divorce. Um, so. So you got the get. I got the get. Um, there was no ketuba, so that made it easier to get the got. Got got the get. Uh, yeah. Goot. I goot well, the got you, the get. You gotta get the get. You gotta get the get. If you don't get the get, then you don't know what you got. Don't be fishnicket. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're such a mensch, Robbie Sandler. Uh, no, it's not. Oh, it's it's not noticing. Jew. It's not the other Jew. It look. His name's David Shapiro, and okay. he's half Italian. That tracks. Yeah, he, but he's also he's an Italian Jew. I just don't know if I can trust that. Are you making me matzo balls or meatballs? Which is it? Because you can't put both so, in the same dish. Okay. Okay, I'm I'm a Jew who married Italian, so I committed to mixing balls eleven years ago, <laughs> and I haven't looked back. Oh, baby, you've been mixing balls longer than your marriage. I'm just gonna go ahead and guess. That is probably technically true if yes. you want to be a little dirty about it yes well just I, like i said i spit facts um anyway uh i do have oh. my in-studio guest i don't spit friend you don't spit oh i'm sorry what was your question who is your in-studio guest i keep distracting you from your jew no that's okay no i don't i don't have a jew here i have a drag queen oh yeah oh so you have a wait okay so you you like all jews except for david the Shapiro. jew you don't like yeah. who is the resident jew which we know because he's not there right well he zooms in okay he zooms in i'll tell you about it later I... he's, he's always on the show okay if you watch this episode he's gonna come on later 
He's just when you say he zooms in, I just imagine this like joyous little Jewish man like sprinting into every room he ever enters, arms outstretched. I think you just little described Mr. Shapiro him. just yeah. zooming into the room. I'm pretty sure you just described David Shapiro. Yeah. Like like Aladdin with no cool. carpet. Did you say like Aladdin with more carpet? No, with no carpet. <laughs> oh. Although, I, <laughs> although, let me tell you about the Jews. I know a couple things about Jews and Italians. Um, there's a lot of carpet. There's a lot of carpet. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, no, absolutely. I, having been to my mother-in-law's house, every room, even the bathroom, and it's all beige. Carpet everywhere. Are we oh, talking about the same carpet. thing? I think we are. I think we are. Um, although, if you're checking out your mother-in-law's carpet, uh, you should come on for a longer interview because I can't break that down but, in the next five seconds. <laughs> no, it's okay. You don't have to worry. There are no drapes. They're mostly Venetian blinds because, again, Italian, Venice. We don't need an Italian on the show, but we do love Jews. Um, thank you, Robbie, for I'll coming on. I'll tell my on. husband to stay in the other room. This was great. Yes. Thank you. Please um, tell the audience when they can see episode two. Chelsea just did, but it's called Who Wrote This Shit? So, yeah. Who wrote this shit? But you can't put the word shit in your handle on anything or you're not allowed to advertise with it. So we are WWTS Live. And you can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on YouTube. I'm going to recommend Instagram because not only will we link you to everything, but on Instagram TV, we make all the older episodes available. So if someone's watching this 10 years from now, you can go watch a thousand episodes of Who Wrote This Shit, the hottest game show on the planet. I am in. I'm going to watch tomorrow at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Yes, Eastern. On Instagram. WWTS Live. WWTS Live. Um, will find you come back on, on my show? Find us everywhere. I'll be back. You'll be. You'll we'll come back here on the show. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. All right. I haven't seen your face, but I'm sure you're in drag. Oh. I only exist this way. Oh, that's awesome. You should watch. You should watch the show. Um, it's on my show. If the audience is watching, they're like, why are you telling We're watching it. We don't <laughs> it's on, on uh, twitch.tv backslash stab comedy, um, YouTube um, stab comedy theater, um, and uh, Facebook. That's and, awesome. Yeah. So you should watch it so you can see what I look like. Um, you saw me last week in the background lurking around being boring Chelsea Beers. Being boring. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I can't wait to talk to you more later off screen and have you back on the show. Thank you, Robbie. Same. Of course. I might, I might have a new favorite Bye. too. Yay. Okay. Bye. Okay. Uh, bees and booze. So um, that was Robbie Sandler. Uh, he is the co-producer co and co-creator and a panelist of Who Wrote This Shit? Um, except you can't find it under that name. It's WWTS underscore live. Check it out. You can find it. Uh, you follow Chelsea no if you watch my show. No underscore. Sorry. WWTS live. Um, if you follow uh, Chelsea, then you already know about the show. And if you don't, then what the fuck are you doing not following Chelsea? Uh, watch their show. It's great. And it has most of my favorite people. Speaking of my favorite people. Um, my in-studio guest has arrived, um, and she is here, and uh, I'm going to bring up my script so I can give her a proper introduction um, so I can do something in this episode correctly. <laughs> okay. Uh, she is very busy this time of year because she's known as the Spooky Ookie Queen, um, but honestly, she's amazing all year round. Um, I love her as a person and as a performer. Uh, which I get to see her most often as a drag queen. Um, so please join me in welcoming Faye Menon. Hi, hello everybody. How are you? I am doing great. How are you, Suzette? I am tired. I am so tired. <laughs> yes. So you, we've talked about makeup and mimosas on the show a lot. Mm. Um, so uh, that's where you were today, but not in a traditional makeup and mimosas. Um, Helen Heels took over for the finale of her reality show, Into the Draglands. Correct. And uh, you were in the top three when the day started. Yes. 
and tell the audience how you where you finished. I am the winner of season one of Into the Draglands. Congratulations, Thank love. Thank you. I'm so happy. I am extremely excited. It was a long road. I, I, I'll tell you, it was it was tumultuous to use a, a great adjective. So, what what was long? When did you when did you film? Um, I can't. If I'm not mistaken, we filmed sometime back in. June when it was still phase four of quarantine let up I guess if you like I, I'm not too sure the proper terminology but we were at phase four and we filmed in June um, and and then we uh, and then right afterwards I think everything went right back to phase one so we really lucked out in the fact that like our timing was impeccable um, it it was a it was a really cool experience because not only were our performances recorded live, but um, they which is it's kind of oxymoronic, if you will, that it's recorded, pre-recorded, but yet it's still a live performance. It, it, it's confusing, but it's an amazing show. So all around, like there's twists and turns because if anybody anybody watching or anybody listening like it knows who Helen Heels is mm -hmm. they know that she's that Helen Heels is synonymous with twists and turns she's the czar of turns she is very much is the czar of turns and I'm that works I I'm gonna come throw that one. out there at her and I think she's probably gonna end up coining it oh I that's what I've been doing for normal brunches like I call her the diva of dance mm -hmm. um, Apple is the chantreuse of cyber sex and the mod of Midtown I can take that um let's see Taryn is the bitch of brunch. Okay, yeah, accurate. She, she loves that. <laughs> um, I probably should be like the quirky queen, but really just a hot mess princess. There's no alliteration. But well, you've been that way. Well, well, you you coined that as well during the original like makeup of Mimosa's brunch. Mm -hmm. Oh, it goes further than that. But she that's what's weird. Taryn said she'd never heard it before, and I was like, no, this is – Hot Mess Princess has been my brand – I remember that since Absolutely. I started. Yeah, because <laughs> I'm a hot mess. That's the theme show, the theme song. You weren't here, but the theme song for the show is "Hot Mess." I know. I'm. I'm really sorry that I ended up. No, no, no. Late. That's not why I said it. <laughs> that's not why. I said, you'll get to hear it on the outro. Perfect. It's "Hot Mess" by um, Cobra Starship. Oh, I love that song. Right. I and know that song. Does it not like? That's accurate. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, okay. So back to you. Sorry. Okay. Um, I didn't mean to hijack that. You're good. Um, so. Uh, brunch you were there today mm -hmm. um with the czar of twists yes and um you you won yes okay i want to table that for a second okay i want to i want to build anticipation Perfect. till we talk about that sounds great let's talk about i don't want to go all the way back but since i've known you which would be a year maybe like 20 months somewhere around there i'd say so <clears throat> to me Mm -hmm. Your drag has evolved, yet it's remained true to who you are. Would you agree? I like that. I very much enjoy that description, very much so. Um, yes, um, Faye has progressed well beyond what I thought she was even capable of, which is an incredible thing to be able to witness and also to be able to experience as me, as Faye, which is incredible. Um, but she's i've always been coined as like the spooky kooky, kooky queen of course but um i i think this competition which is really great like showcase the fact that i'm more than just that but people who know me outside of say for instance this competition like yourself you know that spooky ooky, spooky ooky kooky it's always a tongue twister it is um it's just a box, and unfortunately, like I feel like Faye is too big to be put in that box. See, it's a it's an element of Faye. Mm -hmm. it, it might be um, the seed with which you started. Oh, absolutely! But you've evolved and grown. Very much so. Like I'll give you Halloween, the house down. Like you want you want a Halloween show. You want things spooky. You want blood coming out of the mouth or coming out of a crown. Like I got you. Like I got you. Like if you want to be scared right out of your pants, I'm here for it. 
So what she's referencing, she performed um, a number where blood came out of a crown. So if you want to see that, as always, with all the drag videos, please go to Becca B. Dragon. Go on YouTube, search for Becca B. Dragon. Um, then she has a catalog of Fey Menon references, and you can find it there. So do yourself a favor, and when this is over, go look that up. Don't do it now. Keep watching this interview. Yeah, stay here. Yeah, but after, <laughs> this, after this episode, watch that. Make a note to yourself. Um, so, okay, really quick. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know exactly who my audience is because I can't see them. Okay. Um, but I like when we have, I always want this to be a regular segment, but I haven't gotten anyone to take me up on it yet. Okay. Whenever a drag term comes up, I like someone to define it. So you just said you can give Halloween the house down. Yes. Can you, for the audience, define the house down? The house down. It very much, okay. So the house down is... Um, what I would describe it as, it, it's an, it's a descriptor of it being quintessential to that. It's uh, to that particular subject or that particular subject matter, I guess. So when I say I can give you spooky the house down, it means that I can give you like the best spooky you've ever seen. So you, it, it is the bar. It is the bar, basically. It, like. You are the bar for spooky. Exactly. Well, I, I wouldn't say that, like personally, but like well, if you were I to am. use that term, oh, thank I you. Um, so I mean, would that be would that be a way to say it? Like, it, it, maybe let's not say the bar if you don't want to say that. But it is the quintessential, like you said, quintessential. It's the um, the the standard. I think so. It's it's kind of like more than just the standard. It's like what you come to expect. Like if somebody were to say like. Um, like, for you, for example, mm -hmm. like, if somebody were to see a wig that looks similar to yours and somebody were to see it on another person and they go, oh, that's Suzette, the house down. That means that that is quintessentially what you remind or that's what is reminded of, of course, like whenever somebody sees that blonde hair. So I'm going to this is going to be so not fun for the audience because this is just something that we're going to picture in our minds. Mm -hmm. But um, my birthday brunch at Punchline. Yes. Uh, when Helen came out uh, dressed oh as me my God, and yes. wearing. Yeah, I should post that. If anyone watching the show wants to see it, just message me on Facebook and I'll post the picture. Because when she came out like during the roll call, I was like, why am I over there? Like I was legitimately confused. <laughs> I was like, wait. I'm here. Why am I there? Because it was a Suzette hair the house down and costume. It was Suzette the house down. That's Suzette the house down. It very much was so. Like okay. it, it was, it was you to a T. It, it was really so was. perfect. And she made my face. It was uh, great. It, I I love the picture I have of it because like I'm sitting and like the one time I didn't look like me, <laughs> and then she. Oh yeah, like you me. switched it up at that day. I remember I you did. were like, I didn't know. I don't even look like Suzette, and I always, Helen looks more like. I Suzette. switch it up all the time, but I don't get credit for it. People are like, no, you just look the same always. Um, okay, so spooky ooky the house down, mm -hmm. um, and that's where you started. Um, why did you change is a, a, a pejorative term? I don't mean it that way. Mm -hmm. Why did you grow? Why did you change from just being spooky? I was tired of that box. Being put in a box is a very lonely and solitary kind of like place. Mm. And it really does confine you as an artist. And if you allow yourself to be put in a box, it kind of like as a, oh, well, this is just who I am. And it's like, well, you can be so much more than that if you allow yourself to bring it forth you know and with that i realized that i'm i'm a multifaceted person in and out of drag so why would i not want to show that to people like i think there was i think i can't remember who said it and i believe it was possibly um elena roberts um that said uh, you have to fit the mold in order to break it and I did that and then once I started venturing out of it and it's like people were kind of like wait a minute are you sure you're more than just like you know no eyebrows and wearing all black all the time and it's like yeah absolutely and it's like I can give you a ball gown I can give you a ballad I can do all this stuff and it's like nobody believed me so I just had to prove it 
So it's more or less also that like very childish mentality, not well, not childish mentality, but like I guess you could say like that inner child mentality of, uh, well, I have to prove you wrong. Like you're wrong, so I'm gonna prove you wrong. That's that's yeah. That's I'm envious of that. I would like to. I feel like sometimes I'm in a box, and and I want to show people other sides of me. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that you've done it to the degree that you have, where now you've won a competition, doing that um, is like kudos to you. Thank you. Um, how did you, as you grew and changed? How did you, because? Spooky was where you started. That's mm. where Faye started. Absolutely. So as you grew, how did you stay true to Faye, being that when you started, it might have been a one-dimensional thing, and Faye grew as your performing grew. So how do you stay true to a character when you start one-dimensionally? See, that's a very, uh, it's a very good question. Um, Thank you. I think, <laughs> I think that it's, I think it's very much, it comes down to what kind of person you are at your core. If I can stay true to being spooky, ooky, kooky, me, that doesn't mean that that's all I have to be, you know? So it, it was kind of a, a, a hard time once I first started trying to delve into that growth because um the the growth itself made me question like okay am i actually a spooky ooky kooky queen am i a dancer queen am i like what am i and you have to remind yourself where you started because of course not only is it a great like humbling experience to remind yourself like oh god that's that's where Faye used to be like three years ago Faye, monstrosity and not the good kind but like Faye now she's still Faye at the heart of it because I feel like me as a person Faye is an extension of that and through Faye I still shine you have to remain true to who you are at your core of your person but it doesn't mean that you have to limit yourself within that core you can't expand so who is Faye now that's a good question <laughs> i have no idea um after this competition i really started thinking to myself i'm like who is Faye? like i actually had to ask myself the same exact question um because the more and more that i went into this competition and the farther and further that i got i'm like wow okay maybe you're actually pretty decent like maybe you're actually not as awful as your inner separateur is trying to convince you that you are like it i think Faye now is i think Faye now is that postgraduate student of like okay well now i've gone through the schooling what do i do with all of this knowledge and now i feel like Faye is at that point right now where okay well now i've been able to do all these things and i've also been able to like win doing these things which is astronomically like mind-blowing to me to know that I can like win things over these people that are my my peers that I personally thought that they would be winning in and it, it really makes you reevaluate like you know you you are worth it and you are worth like giving yourself a chance to be a different person but you don't have to change again like who you are as a core person I think Faye now is taking the next step i'm not too sure where that next step is going to be but i'm really excited to see the journey along the way i like that answer thank you very cool i read um, it myself <laughs> <laughs> speaking of the journey mm -hmm. um where just you don't need to go too deep into it but where and when did you start oh i was 15 years old i started at a uh, local charity drag show called sink and drag at the College Avenue Congregational United Church of Christ. Um, I remember it vividly because of the fact, like, this is where the birthplace of my love for drag started. And I remember it was with my best friend, Josh, at the time, and we looked atrocious. <laughs> we looked so bad. I was 15 years old wearing 
an Afro wig, mind you, which I, I do apologize now if anybody goes back and sees that video. I know it's not appropriate. I know it's not great for like me to wear an Afro wig. But we were doing ABBA and we recreated the choreography for Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. And ever since then, like people came up to me and they were like, you stole the show. You were amazing. And I'm like, there it is. There's the spark. I don't ever want to stop doing this. You are the first person I've ever talked to who got their start at a church. I know. Doesn't it seem kind of oxymoronic? It's interesting, for <laughs> sure. It's, I don't know what it is, but it's unexpected for, you know. To start drag just, in a church. Yeah, yeah but exactly. Like, how cool of the church, I guess. It's a very, it's actually a, um, it's a very LGBT friendly church because, mm. like, I believe that they view it as, like, your gender identity and your sexuality don't necessarily like define your relationship with God, which I think is a cool thing. I mean, like I, I don't subscribe to that, but I think it's a really, really great thing. But like, the, the pastor gay. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. The openness is, is, is admirable. And it was for a charity event too, which like felt great, which this will date how long ago this was. We were raising money to help end genocide in Darfur. Well now see, I'm way older than you. So my life just blurs. <laughs> you, said when, you said when you were 15. How old are you now? 27. Okay, so that's 12 years ago. 12 years of drag. Wow, 12 mm. years of drag. Yep. That is longer than, way longer than me. And, like, I was, we just talked, I just talked with Robbie about Apple. Mm. And I just was talking to Apple today about how long she's been doing it. Not 12 years. No. Well, Faye, Faye is four years old. Okay. So, like, I... I've been other drag personas. I've had different names and I've been a part of the community off and on for those 12 years, like performing here and there and whatnot, what I could do being an underage drag queen, because I'll, I'll admit like, it's not easy being an underage drag queen wanting to have the ability to be able to showcase these performances besides just behind a green screen during COVID times, you know? No, I absolutely do. Um, I'm going to take a second, actually, if you don't mind, to plug. Uh, when it's not COVID times, um, Jesse and Stab are so lovely to let Yaya and I host a show for drag queens that are under 21. Yes, the fresh, is it Fresh Faces? or Fresh, Fierce, and Fabulous. That one. Yeah. Ugh, I love seeing those videos pop up on Becca's feed. Isn't it cool? Because and, and I, when Yaya was on the show, we talked about the importance of it because there's nowhere for queens to prefer if you're not 21 i mean a church is <laughs> that's the first one which is probably a uh, like a rarity I'll yeah give you I, that. I gotta say it is um because <laughs> you can't get into bars definitely so and i mean getting performing in a bar no one even when you have this conversation you don't even talk about how you have to earn that you have to climb a ladder yes um so just because you're 21 doesn't mean you get to perform so if you're under 21 it's even harder and I mean, we've we've had uh, some queens from Stockton area, mm -hmm. so we've talked about the Ease of Paradise, which is a great show that you can you can do. You don't, I mean, you definitely have to earn it, but you can also just sign up and you can. The Eves of Paradise has always been absolutely fantastic in that sense that they've, the Eves have always been open. We have an open arms policy, basically. Like, if you want to perform. You can perform, you know, becoming a part of the cast. Of course, you do have to do the standard, like proving oneself sure. as one does. Um, but you have the opportunity to be able to perform and go out there and collect a little bit of coin and do it in a different city. Like if you're from Modesto and then you're tired of the Modesto scene and you want to come up and perform in Stockton, it's like, yeah, it's a little hole in the wall. It's in the middle of BFE, mm -hmm. really, honestly. But um it it's comfortable it's homey homey right not homely because homely is ugly. homely yeah, yeah. Okay. Homely, homely is, that's <laughs> so what chelsea might say about me <laughs> i cannot believe she said you were boring oh honey you have to watch last week's episode you are far from boring i know she's just she says it for the ratings <laughs> um no i mean so so like in sacramento with Apple and with a couple other guests, we've talked about after hours mm -hmm. and how important that is because that is a place where anyone can perform. As long as you're 21, anyone can sign up and perform. 
And it is where so many drag performers in Sacramento get started. Absolutely. Um, but again, if you're under 21, um, I, I just can't say how fortunate, you know, I feel that we can do that at STAB and that STAB lets us. And to give that opportunity. Yeah, to those because it's, it's so cool because, like, they get to their family and friends come. The, this is the, the under, eight, under 21 performers. Yeah. And they, they can perform in li- like live and in person. Exactly. It's so cool. So, okay, so back to you. I'm sorry, I keep getting sidetracked. You're good. You're good. Um, so you started 12 years ago yes. at a church. Um, what was important to you when you started? Oh, boy. Um, being good, which I think is so naive. Like, is it? it? It's such a, well, it's, it's such a young... But it's relative. It is. And the thing that I've, I think that most like seasoned queens will end up telling most like younger queens, especially like underage queens. It's like, stay humble, like knock yourself down a couple of pegs just because you have like 5,000 followers on Instagram. Like you can be really pretty on Instagram, but it doesn't necessarily make you a good performer. So like you have to think about what your definition of good is is it do you look good or do you perform well yeah that's something that we've talked about i think i don't want to say taryn and i had we talked for like two hours so we covered a lot of ground oh yeah um but i know that's come up with a lot of queens is there's more to drag than just looking pretty absolutely there's more to drag than looking pretty and dancing and lip syncing like and there's more to drag than just dancing there it like there drag drag can be many different it's an umbrella term it really is i think it's beautiful how it's blossomed it even. has and it, it's not just a man in a wig lip syncing it can yes. be almost anybody doing anything as long as it fits under the umbrella term of drag which is that's that's why i love drag that's what I, that's what I love the most about drag is that it really is an art form that everybody has the opportunity to be able to like experience. Maybe it's not for you, you know. Like maybe you like maybe you try being uh, like a drag king one day, you know, and it's like mm, yeah, this is fun, and then you try it again, and you're like, nah, I don't really like this. But it's like you had the opportunity to be able to express yourself through this art form that is so beautiful and so deeply rooted in expression and equality and just it drag has saved so many lives it saved my life a couple of times i'll be honest but like it it's just a beautiful beautiful thing that like literally now again like you said it's more than just a man in a wig it's more than just like a a male impersonating a woman Mm -hmm. like it's more than that now and it's beautiful well i i I always liken it 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 can get very complicated and complex describing who can do drag. I mean, anybody is the answer. Yes. But to start to start giving examples can upset people. We live in a very sensitive time. So I always take it back to stand-up comedy. Stand-up comedy is more than a straight white man with a beard telling jokes to a crowd about observational comedy. You can do you can do comedy in so many ways and you can beat anybody. And are ninety five percent of stand up comics straight white men with beards making observational jokes and telling puns? Yes. Are there other people doing it? Absolutely. Yes. So anyone can do drag and I encourage anyone that's watching that would like to know if they can do drag to message one of us. Do it. Because we'll say yes. And we'll tell you whatever your reason is for not doing it. We'll say that's no, that's that shouldn't stop you. See, even people. I think the thing that like really inhibits a lot of people from trying drag is that they see all these amazing things. And I'll be honest, like kids nowadays, like kids nowadays have like YouTube and everything to be like, here's a full on drag transformation that you can follow step by step by step. When I was 15, I didn't have that. I did not have that. I had to figure out like the old fashioned way, but I'm like going, I'm doing the math in my head. I'm like twelve years ago. That's two thousand and eight. Like YouTube still used to be like white yeah, YouTube, and like had the yeah. red little thing up in the right. top corner. It was not. It did not have the wealth of knowledge. No, absolutely not. But like back, it 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 just in case if you think like, oh man, I look really ugly and drag the first time. That doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have the capacity to be able to 
ex again, expand and you don't have the opportunity to be able to really get better about something. And that goes with any skill in life. Like you can't just sit there and say, I want to do this one day and like wake up and be like, you know, what? I'm going to be a drag queen and then go out there and put a gallon worth of makeup on your face and then be like, you know, what? I'm pretty and I'm a drag queen. And it's like, no, it's more than just that. It's about the art. It's about the, the community. It's about the, it's about everything, you know, it's a it, bit, don't inhibit yourself just because of the first time around. Yeah, no, I mean, every, that's a thing. And we've talked about that too. Every drag queen starts out as a booger, Ugh. except me. Uh, <laughs> You're I, perfect. No, I am not. But <laughs> I, I have, I had, a, I have a great drag mom and she made sure that I, did I look mm, my best? No. But did I look better than I should have every yeah. time out? Yes. A million times. Sorry. No, please. Ugh, uh, I'm, I know. I'm, so, I'm like running on literally zero no, no, sleep. No, no, <laughs> no. The, yeah. The audience is familiar with, like, since we started Makeup and Mimosas, I stay up 36 hours from when I wake up Saturday to basically when I get home from this show. So, like, like we were talking with Robbie about David Shapiro. Mm. I have fallen asleep talking to him because he's boring. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so see, maybe, maybe Chelsea's just getting you confused. Maybe. maybe. I think that's it. I think that's it. Just a slip of the tongue. But like, and then Taryn and I were here, uh, three weeks ago mm -hmm. and we're both exhausted because oh. we, you know, we host makeup and mimosas and Bust an ass. so be tired, be tired. Oh, cool. Awesome. Um, okay. Um, I keep getting sidetracked, but you, I love talking to you. Absolutely. And I, I same. This is so interesting. Um, so, uh, I got lost. Um, what do you wish that you would have known when you started? Um, or would you say that your, your career in drag has gone in retrospect the way you would have wanted it to, even with the pratfalls and ups and downs? I don't think that my drag career went anywhere near what I thought it was going to be. Honestly, I just thought it was just going to be for shits and giggles, GBH. Like, I, I just thought it was just super fun, and I had a great time, and I had friends who did drag, and I just loved being part of the community and the fabulousness of it and be able to, like, the, the be like blurring the gender lines. Like, that's always been my thing. I mean, I, I, I live in androgyny, and... Um, what I wish I would have known back when I first started drag is appreciate everything that it brings into your life. Appreciate the people that it brings into your life, both positive and negative people, because the people who are negative in your life that are brought about because of this are lessons in disguise. And all the positive people are there to change your life. Like Helen Heels, I met her on my birthday at Badlands for a Naomi Smalls show. And I went there because none of my friends wanted to do anything with me for my birthday. Nobody. Nobody wanted to spend a single penny that year. I don't know what it was. But I decided I was going to get up there and I was going to go up to Sacramento and I was going to have a good night. And I found out that there was a drag show. And I met Helen that night, and it changed my life forever. Where? Uh, right in the back, like in the back patio in Badlands. At right Badlands. after the show was over, I walked up to her, and I was like, hey, you're Helen Heels, right? She said, yeah. I said, oh, well, I'm, um, and it was my former drag mother. Um, I was like, I'm so-and-so's daughter. And she's like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we started chatting a little bit, and the rest is history. And I, my life has been changed because Helen Heels entered it. And my life has also changed because of drag in its entirety. I have, through drag, come to terms with my own personal gender identity of being non-binary and accepting it as being okay for me to express my femininity outside of drag, which I think is really, really beautiful. Very. Also, um, it's funny because I remember meeting you. I remember where and when. I remember the day. Um, really? Yeah, it was a long day. <laughs> like they all are. <laughs> Another 36 hour. It, it actually was. It was, um, it was a brunch in Old Sacramento. 
Oh my God! Mm-hmm. Oh my if God! If I'm correct, it was February second. It was the Super Bowl Sunday. Um, and yeah, that. What you didn't know is that was the day that Taryn and I met that night to start planning makeup and mimosas. Really? Yeah. And so I fell asleep for like five minutes watching the Super Bowl. Woke up and <laughs> went to side tracks, and we sat in back and we sketched out drawings and we talked about the show. Um, so, but I my what's funny is. And I think you'll laugh. That's why I bring this up. So I remember meeting you. Mm-hmm. I remember meeting Apple. I remember meeting Taryn. I remember meeting almost every drag queen that I performed with. Because it's, it's a thing when you meet, you know, you, you, it, it sticks with you. Especially when you connect to a soul. Right. But I had Juliana on the show a couple of weeks ago. And she asked if I remember. And I remember when I met Juliana. She asked if I remember meeting Helen. And I was like, no. <laughs> I do not actually. I have no recollection of meeting Lucky Helen. you. <laughs> <laughs> and well, like, and I remember. I think it's because I I remember Helen is, like, if there's a Mount Rushmore of Sacramento drag, she's on it. She's all four faces. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I she's at least two of them. I no, I don't even know. But I, Taryn and Apple and Helen and yeah, Merck. I, I think that that would actually be a great Mount Rushmore of that drag sh- of that Sacramento. That should be a question. I should ha- ask that question to oh. my guests. I'm going to need them to Photoshop that together. I'm oh. going to need that in my life. I need that as a well, background on my phone. I'm not going to say who, but one of them is so old. They should be made of stone. Um, Helen. <laughs> oh, okay. I know you're talking about Taryn. <laughs> <laughs> Both. What? Both. What? Yeah, Helen is old. Helen Helen's still will old. not disclose She's her. Old. Her age, um, seventy four, I believe. <laughs> Good moisturizer. I think it's seventy three, but we'll give it a go. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I she she her orbit is so big that when I met her, I was just like, I knew who she was for a long time, and I knew that she meeting me was like, who are you? And not not because she did that, because Helen is sweet and she's wonderful to everyone she meets. Yeah, but like when and I I said this. When, I, when we talked about it on that episode, like when you're a new performer, there's no guarantee you're going to be around in six months because some people do try drag and mm-hmm. they decide not to do it. And so, it, it, you know, I just looking back, I know that would have been my thought if I was Helen meeting me. So, yeah, I have no recollection of meeting Helen. And See, hers is kind of cloudy. She's she's the brass tacks kind of girl too. So like I think most people get intimidated when they first meet her too. Oh yeah, she's like, what do you need? What are we talking about? Exactly. What are we doing? What do you want? Let's not waste time. Exactly. It's like let's get to it. Yeah. Um, so okay, we talked about you being starting out as spooky. Mm-hmm. You like it. It is Love who it. you are. Is it weird when you're not spooky? Because now you've evolved, you've grown, you can be not spooky. Right now you're. I would say a Decepticon, but you're a Transformer. <laughs> yes, I am. An I just Autobot. feel like I feel like Decepticon should be like a drag term. That's actually really okay. Maybe you should coin that one. Come up with a good definition, and now you got to throw it at another drag queen on the next show that you have somebody on. Okay. 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 So, but you weren't you weren't spooky today. No. So, do you like being not spooky? Is it weird? I I think my favorite thing about it is that when people describe or like when people introduce me it, the easiest thing in every every person I feel like at this point like every host that hosts the show that I'm in they always say she's the spooky ooky kooky queen from Stockton which technically I'm from Modesto but um she's the spooky ooky kooky queen and it's always really funny like Apple has mentioned this before she's like I swear to god anytime that I'm like She's the spooky, ooky, kooky queen, Faye Menon, and you come out in all, like, hot pink or, like, pastels. And I'm like, I like to leave people guessing. I don't want anybody to ever go and see Faye Menon on a show, like, on a poster, and I don't ever want anybody to expect anything out of me. I don't want anybody to know what is coming, and I think that's... I love being in my spooky. Don't get me wrong. Like, I love it. Like, I love being in all black, like, looking like Morticia, like, the the whole nine, the fake blood, like, the the everything, the theatrics of it all. I really do. I love, love, love spooky, love horror, love that whole genre. But I love twisting people's... um, notions like pre-existing notions of me prior to Mm -hmm. and i love flipping it on its head 
So like, I love existing in spooky, but I love making people realize that I'm not just spooky even more. You're so much more than just spooky. I'm ooky and kooky. Yes. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's just the three. Just the yeah, three. Stay in that box. You can't do any more, Faye. Um, one of my favorite numbers that I've seen you do uh, was actually on Into the Draglands. It was for comedy. Um, it was oh. the... Uh, I can't not it was the white Branch chicks song. yeah yeah is it is it a thousand miles is yeah that, it's a thousand okay. miles by Michelle I got Branch. it mixed up with the proclaimer song um oh <laughs> 500 Five, miles uh, yeah yeah and I was like 5,000 miles is that right that's a lot that's, that's a really long that's longer than the country <laughs> um you'd have to be in like Nova Scotia just go, like yeah. just go around in a circle San Diego to Nova Scotia I don't know New big Fallon. ass U-turn I don't know what's over here in Canada I I like left I think is Left is Vancouver. Yes. West, but what's east? Is that, I think, Newfoundland and Labrador? I think so. And then, like, right next to it is, like, Ottawa and, like, Ontario and everything like that. Well, like, Ottawa is in, um, is in, uh, Quebec is in Ottawa, right? Yeah, that's And like then Ontario there. is, um, is that a province? I don't know. People, it's, like, red right underneath. People come to this show for Canadian geography. I'm hoping so, because we I are would love to provide that. Struggling to give it. <laughs> Oh, we're American. Oh, boy. Okay. Oh. They're like, we know exactly where you are in Sacramento right now. We know everything <laughs> because we're Canadian. Um, <laughs> have a good day. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, actually, side note, before yeah, you say anything. Please. We actually had, we found out we had international fans of Into the Draglands. We found out that there were people up in Canada watching every single week. Hey. I just wanted to say hey. something. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Hey. Hey, that's incredible. No, it, it was really cool. It was really it was something else. I mean, like, yeah, granted, there are northern neighbors, but, like, I mean, like, they're better than us, let's face it. In a lot of ways. In a lot of ways. <laughs> they don't have a, a shit bag for president. Not to mention Justin Trudeau has, like, <coughs> the ass of a Greek god. It's amazing. <laughs> Ugh. It's my favorite thing. Um, okay. Drag family. Mm -hmm. That is a topic that's come up on the show. Um, and it's, it's, I think I had Aurora a um, lot more on the show and she put it very beautifully everything she said about drag family nothing that I can put concisely um, but what do you have a good drag family or would you just say you have some strong Judy's it's really funny that you mentioned that um, through this experience unfortunately without going into too much detail it was a lot of sisterhood that I thought existed prior to was flipped on its head because of how serious a bunch of us contestants ended up taking this competition. It was supposed to be all in good fun. We all know each other. We all love each other. Like we were all, I think Katana Ray has pointed it out. Like Katana Ray pointed it out one time. She's like, I hate when people talk about like families and it's like, Oh, we're all sisters. And it's like, you don't have to all be sisters. You could just be acquaintances or you can be friends with people. I've had good and bad experiences with drag families. I used to have a drag mother and I used to be a part of like the court system, which is like very prevalent, like Betty Booger. And oh no. We've, Taryn. Yeah. yeah. If anyone is a regular watcher of it, we've had um, Ben Flicker and we talked about it with Taryn yeah so so I used to be in the court system and of course like they're huge on family huge because you have aunties and uncles and mm -hmm. all this stuff and like you have people that you're related to that you have no idea about so like it kind of like warped my mindset of a drag family and then later on down the road trying to like do things myself like when I was 19 performing in like 18 and up clubs mm -hmm. um it was it was cutthroat it was every man pretending to be a woman for himself like it w it really was a it was a lot and then in finding say for instance i wouldn't consider helen to be she's she's a sister to me she really will always be a sister but more so than that like she's my best friend first and foremost that was the hardest thing, by the way, my, like, side note, that's the hardest part about this whole competition thing is the fact that, like, your best friend is the host, and you have to disconnect from your best friend basically, like, the entire time. They can't tell you anything. They can't, like, entrust in you in anything. They can't tell you. They literally cannot tell you anything, and it was really, really difficult because our 
our connection as best friends, like more so than just drag, it it was shooken, shooken, shaken, shook up. There we go. Um, shaken, not stirred. Um, it it very much it, it kind of made me the the whole competition kind of like made me rethink what is my drag family. Is it just because is it the Eves of Paradise just because we perform together every single Thursday? Does that equate us to being a family? And I don't think that it does. That just makes you castmates. And you can be good Judies with your castmates, absolutely. Like you can have a regular cast, you can be a part of it, and you can consider some of them your drag family and others not. And I think that there's something beautiful, like say for instance Jamila, like being a part of the house of Moore. And then rest in peace, her mother, um, passing on like the name, like the head of house, down to her. She now has to take care of like so many drag children. She's the house of she's the head of house of more, which means that she has the responsibility as a drag mother now to all these drag children. And it's really cool to see people rise to the occasion, but I know from experience that not everybody does. Not everything about drag family is positive. Not everything about it is negative, but it, it's, I personally don't, I don't subscribe to the whole drag family thing. You're, you're my friend, you're my performer, you're my sister, but like, in all honesty, like at the end of the day, like I've been stabbed in the back, especially recently. That is, people. that is unfortunate because when we've talked about it on the show before, people have had really, like me, for instance, and I cheated, you know, like I, I just took some relationships my drag mom had and I was like, that must make you my aunt and you're my aunt and you're my aunt. Yeah. So like Helen. Is By association. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. like if they're sisters then, and that's my mom, then that's my aunt. It's easy to put a label on it. It, it is. It easier. But it, it, it for me... I've, it's been the opposite. I've been lucky. But the reason I say that is not to talk more about me. It's actually to talk about you because what I've learned is, especially like with, with like you and Rosie and Yaya and like Bijou, like none of you are like drag family, right? No. But damn if I don't love you guys. And you're all so amazing. Too. Well, thank you. Can make me cry again. No, don't cry again. <laughs> yeah, I know. I already fucked you, up my you makeup made me earlier. Cry today. Um, but like, it's it, not everyone. I know. Has I to saw be, my reflection too. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> not everyone has to be your drag family. Like, you can just have. And and I actually shouldn't have used the words Judy's because I don't think we do. You want to define that quickly? I uh, Judy is basically a friend. It's a very much like a drag term. Like, if you have a good Judy, it's um, usually. A drag queen friend of another drag queen friend so like or if what friend they're drag queen friends god damn it <laughs> just make it easier for myself um judy's are basically like a good judy is a good friend somebody that you can call up and be like hey my boyfriend cheated on me for like the fifth time do you want to go and get like ice cream from Wiener Schnitzel at like 2 a.m. That sort of thing. So it's someone you might like outside of drag. Yeah. Like, not just like a castmate or an acquaintance. Yes, abso absolutely. I believe that's so. Uh, like Helen. Helen is a Helen is a Judy. She's my best friend, but like she's a good Judy as well. Like I can call her and talk to her about just about anything, except when I'm in a fucking competition with her or f of hers. Ugh. So if you don't have a, a good drag family you've been burned um d is it still important to have a good drag support system absolutely absolutely drag support can come from anywhere my mom loves Faye my mom loves Faye and I called her today as soon as I won and I bawled my eyes out I started crying on stage when I got announced a little bit and then once I got upstairs, it was waterworks, Niagara Falls, the whole nine, just like bawling, talking to my mom because it was just, she's like, why are you crying? Are these happy tears? I'm like, yes. But the moment I told her that I won, I, she screamed and Helen even heard it over, like over my shoulder. 
Like, and she wasn't on speakerphone or anything like that, but you can hear my mother screaming over the phone. Um, my roommate is Arya Gunna. She's another drag queen. Um, absolutely fantastic, really super creative. And I consider her, I consider her a sister, but mainly because I view Mario outside of drag as a brother almost because he's been my best friend. He's been living with me. My mom, like, allowed us both to move in when we were unfortunately getting kicked out of our other place for unforeseen circumstances but whatever having a good support system having people being like I love what you do and I'm going to stand the hell out of it until the end of days it's like that's that's the kind of drag support system you need and a lot more people are out there feeling that way about you than you think like a lot more people need to be reminded that like there are people out there that love you and it doesn't matter the numbers it really doesn't like even if I only had my mom believing in me like I would still go out there and give that exact same energy as I gave on stage today if I believed that one person believed in me that that should be enough it shouldn't be about like thousands of followers or anything like that it should be about like I mean like even if you have thousands of followers that's fantastic you're doing something right like, look at Bijou. She and I have talked about, like, her following and everything like that. But, like, Bijou behind the curtain is an amazing, amazing person. Mm -hmm. Like, really, like, Benny is so bad, so down to earth. And, um, but she has a support system outside of that. And I know that's just as equally important to her. Just as much as having a support system outside of the drag community is also just as equally important. So support systems are beneficial. Oh, absolutely. Um, okay. We have talked for almost an hour. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I, when you guys were doing the, the reunion show, I was like, oh, they think they're going to be 40 minutes. They don't know how time goes so fast. Oh, God, that reunion. We don't have to talk about we, it. I just, we shouldn't. Just, <laughs> just, the, just the way time goes when you're interviewing, because I've, I'm, this is the 26th episode, so I have a pretty good handle of like... Oh, I think Faye and I could probably talk for, like, a long time. A good minute. Um, so I want to ask you, um, mm -hmm. you're tired. You have a drive ahead of you. Yeah. Would you like to keep going, or do you want to Oh, I've got – I'm going down to the – house. like, I'm going back to my house. Like, house, house, as in the House of Omega. Actually, that's actually really funny that we're talking about family. Mm -hmm. The House of Omega, um, for those who don't know, um, we're part of the production team on – into the Draglands, and I became really close to them through that experience, and also like prior, like a little bit prior to, but definitely through the experience of like Into the Draglands, brought me closer to them, and they wanted me to be a part of this conglomerate that they called the House of Omega, um, and it's been really cool to know that I have a family outside of drag as well because I know that they would still have me as part of the House of Omega even if I never did drag again a day in my life. And so, and the House of Omega is on Instagram so people can go there. Yes, Alpha Omega is uh, Daddy Mikey. And then there's uh, Johnny, uh, other secondary daddy of the House of Omega. And then... Yeah, we've got Carlitos, we've got Alfie, and then myself. And I believe there was a contemplation of adding another queen to that, uh, to the house as of recently. But as of uh, drama <laughs> has ensued, thanks to this wonderful, beautiful, uh, absolutely crazy but exciting competition of ours. Well, we don't have to get in. I think that. it's. I think it's been reconsidered. <laughs> yeah, we'll stay away. I hope. Um, <laughs> Speaking of the filming, yes. Um, what was so you filmed all the episodes in in one day? Uh, two days. The two great, days. The great thing about it is that we were able to choose: do we film four episodes one day and then three the next, or three one day and then four the next? And it was split up um, where you would have a day break in between. Okay. Um, did you like that? Do you wish you had been able to do one episode a day? I like the idea of one episode a day, mainly because that's what we're used to with, like, say, for instance, like, Drag Race, like, for the, because Drag Race is definitely, like, 
it's a household thing. It's on VH1. Literally anybody can watch RuPaul's Drag Race nowadays. Like, it's crazy. And we're so used to seeing, like, one episode per day from them. And with us, it was really crazy because we jam-packed everything, which... Um, during the reunion, Katana brought up a, a really good point that it kind of like, n- not necessarily hindered, but it definitely put a, um, it put a boundary on like what our makeup looks were, how we can change stuff up. We really had to be um, organized and well thought out within our planning as to what episodes we would be doing what day and in which order. Because what not a lot of people know is that I, my second day of filming was my live episode, which was episode six, followed by episode four, and which was And say dance. what you did in the episode, so it, context for people. So for episode six was our live episode, which again is kind of oxymoronic, which was... Um, but uh, it was, I mean, I was a judge for the episode. And, yes, and, you were. And the, the live aspect was not that it was a live, I mean, it was a live performance, but the live aspect of it was that it was something you could do for a live audience. Exactly. Um, that they would enjoy. Which I did the uh, Ratlin bog, which if uh, the viewers at home are, un- like, are unfamiliar with it, it is an Irish folk song that requires a lot of repetition and a lot of memorization. <laughs> and it is, it's great. It's super fun to just like, do around St. Patrick's Day. I actually, what's funny is that there's only one episode in which I did a new song. Everything that I did in Into the Draglands, I've done before at one point or another. And the thing is that nobody had seen it. So I'm like, I'm going to showcase this. And well, the rat, the right. Rat. I think, I think too often, um, it, it, it kind of goes both ways. Sometimes drag performers will do a number to death and sometimes, Ugh. It's like they'll do a number once and toss it, and it's like, no, bring that back. See, I've done that before. I've done that so many times. I used to think, like, no, you can't repeat numbers. You have to constantly do different things. And it's like, God, girl, just pull out the old mix and save yourself a little bit of effort. Like, good God, get a grip, girl. Like, it's it's not – it's just drag. Like, do the same thing. Put on the same wig. Put on the same, like, misshapen leotard, some thigh-high boots, and call it a day. But um, going back to what you were saying, like I really I liked I I liked it, and then also disliked the setup of the multiple episode per day filming. What did you dislike? Uh, well, it, it definitely like didn't allow for a lot of um. It didn't allow for a lot of expansion I feel like I could be using that word that's the word of the day um, I, I felt like it didn't allow for a lot of expansion with in our uh, or outside of our comfort zone if you will um, like really pushing ourselves to that limit and everybody definitely pushed themselves if you go back if you if I highly 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 suggest everybody go on YouTube on work w e r r r k on their YouTube and watch the whole season. It's absolutely phenomenal. Like being a part of it, yeah. Biting off my nails, anxiety ridden, every single episode, am I going home? Am I winning? What's going on? Who's coming back? Who's going home again? Like that sort of thing. The czar of twists. The czar of twists, Miss Helen Heels, absolutely. But um, personally, I would prefer to, like if it was like one episode per day. Like, I feel like that would have been cool, except for time reasons and time management reasons, well, I and, think. And COVID also. Exactly, yeah. And then it it just worked itself out that way. And it worked out best because it did allow us to push ourselves really, really, really hard. Was there a perf- – so you filmed all your performances in two days. Yes. And then the show didn't air for another month, month and a half. I want to say about a month and a half after. Yeah. Was there, was it, was it hard to film? You knew that you, f- we were filming episodes for every, or you were filming performances for every episode, but you could be sent home after the first episode. Was it hard performing a number 
knowing it might not be part of the show? Yes and no. Yes in the sense that I, I feel like everybody knew like every like every single person that signed up for that competition knew that they could go home on any given week. Um, however, the no, in the sense that it forced me to really push myself within all of those performances in order to give my 150 to ensure to myself that I would not be going home. And I feel like we saw that with a lot of our performers. There were some amazing performances. Oh, my God. We were just talking about that. And there are some really great performances that also didn't get to be shown on the show, too, that we got to see in, like, the behind-the-scenes show, the Beyond the Draglands on Helen's page. Mm -hmm. Like, I will... Ugh, I cannot stop talking about it. Clive Max doing his live number when he took uh, a grinder, or, like, a, um, like a metal saw, mm -hmm. I guess. And, like, stuck it against his crotch that had, like, a metal plate on it. Oh, so hot. So absolutely hot. Like, I was instantly turned on, and I will not stop talking about it. And I will not stop standing that performance. Well, and it's that that's cool that he did that during the live episode because, all, I, again, I judged. And we all said, that's a number that should be done live. And then he did it today. Um, at brunch, he did that number live. I thought that's what I saw. Okay. Oh yeah, okay. yeah. It was it, and it's it was as good as we all knew it would be. Oh, um, I'm so it. bummed that I missed that. Like, I mean, well, I'm glad because otherwise I would have had to go through another pair of panties. But like, I mean, hey. But you can always go to uh, Becca B Dragon's YouTube and find the recording and watch it there. there yeah, you go. and and hopefully, um, I don't know if Clive watches the show. But um, just like we talked about, there are numbers you should keep as a performer, Ab and he should keep that. Absolutely, he should he should grind that crotch. Oh, yes, a lot. <laughs> Apple Adams is a very lucky woman. <laughs> yeah, I told her today. Um, was there a performance that you performed, a number that you performed in in the taping for Into the Draglands, and you thought, "Fuck, I'm gonna go home on that." Oh boy. Um, yeah. Yeah, my dance episode. The fourth episode, I thought I was going home. Really? For sure. Oh, yeah. Because you are, I mean, spooky, ooky, kooky, but you also are a, a dancer. Yes. And that's the thing is that I was so confident prior to, but mm -hmm. when I watched it, I'm like, oh, shit. That was not good. <laughs> okay. There was nothing. I was not proud of that one. Definitely not proud of that one. But so there was nothing that you filmed and immediately thought, shit. Immediately thought shit. Um, best drag, episode one, I immediately thought shit because I injured myself. So what a, a lot of people actually don't know is that episode seven was filmed after that. And on a twisted ankle, I still got in that blue ball gown that I wore today for the for the crowning, uh, which, by the way, was made by my roommate, Aria Gunna, very talented. Um, I wore that, and I got up and still did that episode after I had hurt myself, but I thought to myself, I'm like, bitch, why does it matter? That's episode seven, and you just fucked up your ankle in episode one. What makes you think you're going any further? But, lo and behold, as the way that the world turns, like, go figure, I ended up winning that episode. Blew my mind. And I was like, that wasn't even, that, there's no way. But, like, the moment that I had hit the floor and I knew I hurt myself, I'm like, shit, this is where I go home. This is where I go home. But no. And now she won. She, she won. She did win. She did win. Um, let's see. How do you feel? D be honest. Mm -hmm. And I want you to be okay. very honest. How do you feel the judging was? What's really funny is that a lot of the contestants had something to say about the judging in particular. And personally, I didn't have a problem with my judging. Because if you go back, I actually did not receive a lot of negative like um, critiques. 
um, I didn't receive a whole lot of like like judging really I mean I was read for my tights by Taryn for like the very like last episode but for the most part I don't think I received any really harsh critiques so my experience with the judging was not that of what like my fellow contestants had to put up with because I've, I've, I've heard from literally so many of them that they felt like it was unfair and that there was a lot of just like things that were said for the sake of being negative oh and i'm like y'all it it's not that big of a deal i can't say how much that i can i would like to say like no like not only did i judge two episodes but i was actually like present for like on crew yeah i was present for some of the other judging like and I can say for me personally, like, you don't, first of all, I don't know how many other judges felt this way, because it was the Mount Rushmore of Sacramento Jag Jag that was judging, Mm -hmm. with Apple and Helen and Taryn and Doomy and Betty and Mercury, yeah, Yeah. and DJ Pocket. I was like, oh boy, people are going to be like, why is she judging me? But you have a place in this community. Uh, and a valid place at that. And I need you. to remind you of that. Thank you. I'm not fishing for compliments, though, so I appreciate it. You're very but um, not only did I feel that, but it was like, I don't want to say anything mean, but I don't want to just... There's this thing that happens in stand-up comedy, um, and, and Jesse could attest, um, at open mics especially, no matter what, in, unless you're at touch of class which is um, Sacramento's um, best black room because they, they will not clap if you're not funny. Ooh. They will boo and tell you to get off. They are like the Apollo. They wow. Will, they will say, you're not funny, get off stage. But everywhere else, you just kind of, you get that. Good job. Yeah. And it's like, that's not helpful. And if, 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 it's, if I'm a judge, and I, I think all the judges would agree with this, not, not saying like, why should I be a judge? Um, but I did feel like Helen put me in, in episodes where I was qualified to judge. I will say that. Absolutely. Comedy and live. You yeah. are a stand-up comedian. Who I don't know if stand-up comedians would agree with you, but I, that is what I do. You are a stand-up comedian. Thank you, love. Um, I appreciate that. You're very welcome. Um, you, I, the judges, we didn't want to. We, it's our job to tell you what could have been better. Yeah. And, and and we all tried to be constructive because that's if if you if you didn't win the episode and even if you did something every one of my performances every one of my stand up sets every one of my drag numbers something can be better i have never performed a perfect number or set in my life well even like super quote unquote perfect people can always do better right the only person you should be in competition with is the person you were yesterday so i mean at that point just always do better yeah i don't think i'll ever do a perfect set no matter how good i get and and so it's like i want to know what could have been better i i look at a number and i'm like oh and people can be like that was amazing and i see the flaw and and so as a judge for a competition show no one was trying to be negative I mean, we and and they edited uh, the editing was was very wonderful because especially with the comedy, like that is a place where I feel qualified to assess, as Taryn would say, as you should. And and it's like it it was very well edited, but we also didn't say anything. No one meant to hurt any feelings. No, no one. No one sought to, to offend anybody. It was just like, hey, this is why you got the score you did. Even though we didn't, we didn't know what the score was. Yeah. But it was like, this is why I might have liked that other performance more, or how I could have liked yours better. Yeah. So, I'll say that as a judge, um, personally. I um, feel like it, the honesty is a necessity. It. What's the point otherwise? And when you go into a competition, you know you're going to be judged at one point or another. So as a contestant that has deliberately and willingly signed up to do a competition, you should be just as equally prepared to be judged. 
And if you take these judgings as like a negative thing and you're like, oh, no, well, she doesn't know what she's talking about because blah, 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 blah. And you'll hear a lot of like personal attacks because they're lashing out, of course. But like it, you're going to get judged. Here's the Even thing. out of sight of a competition. Yes, that's what I was going to say. The thing is, and we, we encourage anybody that wants to do drag to do drag. And I encourage anyone that wants to do stand-up comedy. It will destroy your life. But go ahead and do it. Um, <laughs> Give it a go. That's what we. That's going to be a theme on next week's episode with my comic friend that's coming on. His advice whenever people are like, "What? What? Sh- I want to do stand up comedy. What advice do you have?" He's like, "Don't do it. Quit. Get out of here." Most drag queens will say the same thing. Right. What's your advice for when I first start drag? Uh, quit. Don't. Yeah. Like, get it out of your head. <laughs> just and and here we are. Like, come, little children, do it. Yeah, do drag, but don't do drag. Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> It's um, fine. Yeah, stealing some Eddie is hard. Um, <laughs> so uh, you're gonna if you if you sign up to be a performer in anything, and and I can speak, you can speak with me on drag, and I can speak on stand up comedy. You're going to get judged by everybody. Maybe not your mom. No. <laughs> if you have a mom like mine. Definitely your mom, <laughs> but you're going to get judged by everybody watching every performance. Yeah. And if you can't take that, then you should consider if performing is right. Yep. I and and I don't agree. mean that in a, in a negative way. I just mean that like, I am not everyone's cup of tea. No. The people that like me, like me and other people are like, I do not get it. It, that's the thing is that you don't have to get it because right. there's three other people over there that do get it and they like what I do. Right. Well, and I think that's the same for every performer. I don't think everybody loves, I mean, there, there may be like these, these Mount Rushmore Queens that we're talking about. Maybe everyone loves them. Oh no. Plenty of people hate them. Okay. Plenty of people hate them. Well then there you go. Nobody likes I everybody. I hate all of them. No kidding. <laughs> um, it, you, you're always going to be judged, even if you are a judge. Yeah. Judgment is like what we do as humans. Like we just have a tendency to just judge other people. We're all catty bitches. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, Some of us are better than others. And it's, it's not easy to, and, and I like that Helen said, um, cause she was talking today and, and I, I think this is public. Hopefully I end up at the next makeup for mimosas and I don't go missing. Um, <laughs> But she wants the judges to, or the competitors to be on the opposite side. Now that you guys have all competed, she wants them to know what it's like to be a judge. Yes. Um, I think this is, I think this is fair enough with an NDA standards. We well, don't um, have to say it. I can get in trouble. Oh, wait, this is going to be talked about on the reunion anyways. So pish posh. Um, I think it's really cool what what Helen wants to do with any perspective, mm-hmm. like new perspective performers that are like, I loved into the drag land season one. I want to be on season two. What she's doing is that she's going to direct them to one of us yes, and have us talk to them and give them the real talk. And if somebody wants to talk to me, regardless of me winning, I'm not going to sit there and sugarcoat it and bullshit them either. I'm going to tell them straight up like, no, I literally lost friendships over this competition. Like I'm no longer friends with certain people that I used to consider family. But like there were people that I have like had so much of the like utmost respect for their art and their like as a person. And then now because of this competition, it's completely gone. And it's it's mind boggling and it's heartbreaking at the same time but like I think that contestants need to know that this is what they're getting themselves into if you're friends with somebody like you need to be prepared for the fact that like you you may shake things up and you may not necessarily be as close to them as you used to be Katana and I are like at at this point like we have since talked and she has since apologized um, for some of the things she said but um she even said herself she was like we don't have to be okay right now i think that's a really admirable thing that's one of the things that i've always admired about katana is that like she is a very honest person and it is she is correct like we don't have to be friends right now but you have to know what you're getting yourself into when you get in these competitions 
in, in not just not just into the drag lands. If you're taking it seriously and you're a performer, you're gonna want to do your best. Absolutely. And why, it's why wouldn't going, you? It's going to hurt when you're against people and they do better because you want to have pride in yourself. But in doing so, like going about it with telling people, like in in, in putting others down because you feel inadequacy and you're not dealing with that properly, then that's where a lot of issues lie in. Like, you can't, you have to have thick skin. To be a performer. At point blank period, yes. Yeah. I if think, you're going to be up on stage. The thing. You, need to be a, you need to have thick skin to be a performer. And if you're going to be in a competition as a performer... You should already have the thick skin. Yep. Put and, your walls up. Do whatever you got to do, it's, Judy. It's hard, though. It's And, and I, I, I do empathize because I, I've i competed. And it's it can be it can be a lot. Oh, and, yeah. And so I, I, I admire, and, and like I said this today at brunch, um, all the performances were amazing. And oh. I watched them, and I was like, oh, boy, I should quit. <laughs> like, no. No, no, no. Again, not fishing for compliments, but it's like you were amazing today, you Thank know? You. Thank um, you. And I, I, everyone was amazing. Clive's live number was amazing. Um, so the other, The up. other finalists were amazing. The, the other contestants were amazing. Taryn's. Taryn was amazing. Oh my god, I heard she did like stunts and everything, and I missed out on yes. that one too. She did things I've not, and I've been doing shows with Taryn now, you know, at least once a month for eighteen months. Yeah, for a months. while now. Yeah, and I saw things I've never seen, and I was like, "Damn!" Ugh. Like I'm so mad that I missed that. Well, again, you can check it out on I can, Beat I Dragons. Can drag it. <laughs> just have a little sponsor crawl that comes just across. Just constantly. Yeah. Check them out here. Here's a link. Um, after the show. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, exactly where the credits are. Exactly. Speaking of after the show, mm -hmm. um, I am going to say that's – let's let's get to the rapid fire questions. Okay. Because I could talk to you, honestly, for four Forever. more hours. Yeah. yeah. And my audience might be like, Suzette, we okay. love Faye, but not you that much. Oh. <laughs> so it's Chelsea. Chelsea's my audience. Um, She's so like, stop being boring. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to say if you want to come back, um, you know you're always welcome here. Oh, thank you. And, and, and I would love to have you back, and we can talk more, and I come up with more questions. I would love to be back. This, is, this has been great. I love thank this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, but – I always end my interviews with rapid fire. All right, Faye Menon. All right. Are you ready for rapid fire questions? I believe so. Okay. What is your favorite thing about the existence of brunch? Uh, the food. Mm. Mm. Yeah. The food. Which Makeup and Mimosas has a really good food so good. from uh, Sume Poke's pop up picnic. Seriously, like, trust me. It's really good. I spend money on it, and I'm happy to. Um,. What is a drag name that you didn't end up using? Now you said you've performed other 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 personas, <laughs> so do you just want to name some names that I didn't end up using? I used to, oh my god, I you, cannot believe I'm about to abandoned. admit this, but I used to be Vivi Vuitton, Vivi Vuitton. Don't know where it came out of. Pulled it out of my ass. I'm so glad I got rid of that. So glad. Um, there was um, knocked. Uh, like there was something about nocturnal emissions and there's something there's a actual queen by the name of nocturna lee missions and i'm like god damn it i should have gone with that one um oh god um faye was i think i think i, think I shot out faye menon to helen heels and she's like oh that's funny she's like you should stick with that and then faye menon stuck ever since so y'all can thank if helen heels for coming up with that one but in I her in her sixty fourth year on the earth, she yes. came up with Faye Menon. I think we just dropped it down ten years too. No, no, no. That was because we've got, we're going back. Got it. To to when you came up with the name. I mean, <laughs> only four years, so I guess she was seventy. But there we go. That's, I was trying to make her seem younger. That's fair. Um, what is your favorite wig color? Oh God. Um, it's just black. funny to ask you right now. Black. 
black. Oh, yeah, it's really funny to ask me because I'm bald. <laughs> I never in a million years would have thought I would have ever been bald, but, like, you do what you got to do in order to win a competition. Hey, a crown fits really comfortable on top of the skin. Right on, queen. Um, black. Okay, do you name your wigs? Uh, no. <laughs> I know people, people do. who do, but yeah. I do not. I, well, they, I, I don't take care of them. I throw them in a box. They too. Yeah, like Alexandria or this one's Beyonce. And it's like, and if you have a wig named Beyonce and you look down at your skin tone and it looks a little bit more pale, like, girl, put that wig back. It's not for you. Uh, when you put on a bra, do you clasp it in front and spin it or do you clasp it in back with supernatural un unearthly arms? Trick question. I do not wear bras. Okay. So neither. Neither. <laughs> uh, how high is too high for high heels? Oh my god! Um, uh, oh shit. Um, anything over like a six-inch stiletto is just like ungodly. Agreed. Like six inches is still like already taking out the ink and quill to write your own death certificate at that point. That's all I wear are six-inch stilettos, <sighs> but like. A seven inch stiletto? Fuck no. No. Uh uh. That is like six inch all day. My every foot day. doesn't go that way. Like your foot does not naturally or should never naturally be in an incline of a seven inch heel. Absolutely not. I will only wear my seven inch heel when I'm hosting my comedy show. Mm. And all I have to do is like teeter out, introduce somebody, and teeter off. Yep. I will never perform in those shoes. Never. And I don't think anybody ever should. Um, not even for a stand up set. Oof. I don't want to fall down in the middle of the set. No. Um, what is your favorite show, like recurring show to perform in? I, I miss makeup and mimosas, honestly. Like, I know I used to be part of, like, the standard. But, like, it was getting there to be part of the standard cast. But, like, you were. I miss... I, I miss makeup and mimosas so tremendously. Like, and I'll... And I'll, I'll yeah, honestly... I always had the most fun every single one of those Sundays, every single one. Like well, there was, there was shitty days of the eaves, but there was never a shitty day at makeup and mimosas ever. I am so excited you'll be back on October twenty fifth. I am so excited to be back. I can't begin to tell you how excited I am. We still have some tickets left. It is our Halloween. Because I mean, she's grown, but she's still spooky. She's still got you spooky, right? Spooky. So October twenty fifth, makeup and mimosas. Um, we have some tickets. Five bucks. Yeah, right? I mean, how, how do you not come? Five bucks. Five bucks, and you get the Mount Rushmore of Sacramento drag, you and me. Yep. See, and I mean, what else could you want? You're worth five bucks. <laughs> um, more. Thank I, you. I'm just, I'm a throw in. <laughs> She's um, sprinkled. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite venue to regularly perform in? Ooh. Um, I used to love performing at Sidetracks. I loved performing at Sidetracks. Well, actually, no, I'll take that back. Like, it, it's a tie between Sidetracks and Paradise. Do you think that your familiarity... I'm tired. Mm -hmm. Your familiarity with Sidetracks helped you in Into the Dragonlands? Yes and no. Mainly because, like the stage was set up and we had parameters in order to be able to, like, perform within, like, a certain area. Mm -hmm. Um... So I don't think, like, the knowledge of, like, how the layout was, because basically every single performer who was on this season has performed at Sidetracks. So performing there kind of was just like, oh, okay, well, this is where it's going to be. Okay. See, I, I don't think I would – I think I'd agree for drag, but doing stand-up in a place that I've done it before, mm -hmm. audience is always different. You never oh. get the same audience twice. But, man, to be in, like, doing sets at Punchline – every time feels like home oh doing sets here i love doing sets here i will admit i i, I liked punchline i loved the people i loved the people that used to come to punchline and then I like the staff and then the punchline san francisco was like way different and mm -hmm. i'm like this is not home right. this, these are not people that are my people this is like it was just it felt foreign and alien and i didn't like it yeah, we we had a home with makeup and mimosas. We really did. Um, but we have a new home. Yes. And I think a lot of people like our new home. So I do. I don't think we'll move. Um, do you have a favorite song to perform to? 
Oh goodness. Um, favorite song to perform to? Um, mm. Probably Freak Show by Britney Spears. It's always like, it, it, usually some DJ always has access to that particular song. Super easy. Or, um, yeah, probably Freak Show by Britney Spears. It fits the criteria and it also gives me opportunity to dance. What is the funniest thing an audience member has ever said to you after a show? Oh my God. Um, <sighs> Clearly n nothing, I want to say about like 80% of anything that's said to a drag queen after a show is said through inebriated lips. So, um, oh God. Some, some guy was there with his girlfriend and I had like moved in a certain way and I didn't even know that I moved in a certain way and I think he was like, He's like, girl, you are so smooth. I just want to put you on my morning toast. And I was like, go home. <laughs> like, go home. With your girlfriend. Yeah, exactly. Go away. <laughs> That's Thank you, but go away. I, I don't think it was on the show, but um, at brunch one day, there was a guy at Lowbrow when we were outside. Mm -hmm. And he was just staring at me. And he, like his girlfriend was cute. And I was like. Why'd you look in this way, baby? Like, you got a girlfriend next to you. Yeah, she's good like, looking. You can't stop looking, though. Hmm. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, that was just a humble brag, I guess. <laughs> uh, it's like, oh, he thought I was good. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. uh, who is your favorite LGBTQ activist? Activist? Oh, uh, shit. <sighs> Boy. Um. Or let, you can you can expand on that if you want. You can say... Um, it doesn't have to be an activist. It can be a, a representative of the LGBTQ community. I wouldn't necessarily consider her a representative of the, of the LGBT community, but definitely like AOC, Alexandria. Like, I think that she gets it from like an outside perspective of the LGBT. Like, she's not a part of like the rainbow people. Sure. But she gets it and she understands it and she supports it and she like rallies for it and everything. And it's just, I live for the fact that there's a woman who happens to be straight and she happens to be in a place of power and she recognizes this and she recognizes her power to be able to bring betterment for these people. And that is beautiful. Not to mention, I'm still hoping that she's going to be our first female president one day. So let's hope we have a female president mm. at some point. Um, Maybe she'll get fixed. Well, a democratic one. Um, <laughs> Uh, what was I going to say? So, uh, oh, allies are important. That's what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. um, okay. What is your favorite item on the gay agenda? Like the false gay agenda that yeah. all, like all the like cra crazy people think? Exactly. What is my favorite item on the uh -huh. gay agenda? Probably... Probably that we just want to seduce all men into like giant satanic orgies. <laughs> and I'm like, that sounds like a great Saturday night. I don't know about you, but like. <laughs> well, I, I, Robbie Sandler doesn't want to get too crowded, but I think he's in. Um, oh, yeah. Is he? I He might have been. Uh, he likes mixing balls. Mm. Um, same, same girl. Uh I like that you said, what's your favorite item on the gay agenda? And then you tongue popped. And I thought you were just going to stop there. And the tongue pop was your favorite item. <laughs> on That's the, it. <laughs> on the gay agenda. Just tongue pops. <laughs> oh, crrr. Oh, crrr. Uh, <laughs> what do you think has been more affected by COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic? The gay dating scene or the straight dating scene? Oh, probably the straight dating scene because I think straight people are smarter. Gays are still <laughs> hooking up. Like, I mean, uh, yeah, we've all been hooking up. Like, gays have still been hooking up. Like, I have seen more people on Grinder and Scruff during COVID than I've ever seen in my life. Ever. And I've had that shit since I was 18. So, like, yeah, there's plenty. There's, like, new people in my neighborhood popping up, like, every other week. And I'm like, who the fuck are you people? It is National Coming Out Day. 
As of today, isn't it? Yeah. Oh my God. Happy National Coming Out Day. Um, I've been meaning to actually, I totally forgot about that. I mean, this whole competition, I guess, took precedence. It's been a long day. I've been meaning to come out as non-binary, so like. Oh. Well, well, yep. So, that happened. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> Thank you. Congrats on coming out as non-binary. Thank you. Um, so when we say she won, we, we're just saying that. Because as a queen, queens are often referred to as she. I, I like all pronouns. Okay. Personally, for me, like I, lo I, I love the fluidity of the pronouns that are used with me. Like, if somebody wants to uh, like refer to me as they them, like that's cool. But I like physically, outwardly identify male, mm -hmm. so I see people like people are gonna say he, him, his, you know. And then in drag, they're gonna say she, her, hers. Oh, I hope. Um, but <laughs> if a drag queen spends four hours getting pretty, don't call the drag queen a he. He, yeah, unless, exactly. Unless they want it that way. Exactly. Like, unless it's to their request, don't do it. Yeah. But um, the funny thing is, is that I, I really love the fluidity of pronouns with, like, your drag friends. Mm. Because even outside of drag, even if I'm hanging out with Helen outside of drag, I'll be like, oh, no, she was, she's terrible. Like, or, like, oh, she was pissing me off. And I'm very clearly talking about Jonathan mm -hmm. and not Helen. Right. But anytime that like, yeah, like it's just interchangeable. So I like all pronouns. Weird transition. Mm -hmm. Going back to the last rapid fire question. Yes. This usually makes more sense there. <laughs> with with <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, with you coming out as non-binary, this is strange to ask now. But uh, what's your favorite position to imagine straight people having sex in? Oh, my God. Um See, weird transition. Mm, uh, oh, 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 oh. Okay, so there's this one sexual position that I just recently found out about. Go on. Or oh, okay, okay. I will be honest. I I am a connoisseur of like pornographic material of like both gay and straight. Like, I I'll switch it up every now and then. Your verse. So exactly. So, um, I will. Uh, I, I, I love <laughs> there's this one sexual position that I think is absolutely like mind boggling and anytime that I see it in porn I cannot help but laugh I can't like I can't do anything even if I'm in the middle of like pulling the page at that moment I'm like I, I can't I can't keep going I have to stop because I'm laughing so hard like it, it <laughs> I think it's probably like a really cool like position but like it's where the guy will have his legs up and then the girl will be holding his legs up and then kind of thrusting herself onto his penis. So it's basically like role reversal, but like, so she's still she's being penetrated. She's a power bottom. But she's a power, yeah, I guess she would be a power bottom at that moment. Yeah. Ah. But I also think a really funny one to try and like fr from like gay to straight terms, like I think of one that would be really funny is where two guys are kind of like turned backwards and they are both able to like insert themselves into one another. Like I would really like to see the straight equivalent of that. I can't imagine any of that. This is why I need to have this show with Chelsea <laughs> and Heather. I can't imagine any of these positions. It's been that long. Someone is dusty. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, what is your your favorite sex position? Uh, doggy, fully. I, I I know it's like a lazy cop out, but honestly, it's like it's the most comfortable for like most men. And when I mean like by most men, it's like it like de depending like regardless of size or anything like that. Most of the time, if you're a bottom and you're in doggy, it's just just like it's comfortable. You don't have it's to going. explain it. It's going. Yeah, I mean, you can't. My favorite is when we have comics, you know, they're, and queens are usually very quick with it as well. And I don't want answers to answer like on the couch with ice cream. Boo. I mean, Boo. it's funny, though. It's funny. I'm like, no, I'm on all fours and don't look at me. <laughs> Your candor is, is lovely. Thank you. Um, <laughs> do you cook or bake? Again, strange transition. Uh, mm, I used to be really, really into baking. Mm -hmm. Like, um,. I want to say like right where when I was like 21, like 20, 21. Um, but now I've gotten into cooking more often, but I get cooked when I'm baked. So 
like or I cook when I'm baked. So I guess oh. it's like both. Right on. Yeah. Um, if we are at the bar and someone comes up and they want to buy us shots, what are you choosing for us? An iguana shot. Iguana shot. What is an iguana shot? Iguana shots are, um, I believe it is uh, a half and a half, like, same parts, tequila and uh, apple pucker. Oh, girl, I'm out. <laughs> oh, they're delicious. I don't tell if, – if someone does that, don't tell me what it is because I will walk away. Oh, yeah. Either that or – I trusted you too, Faye. <laughs> it's either that or Jameson with a pickleback chaser. And not like not like that shitty pickleback that comes already packaged in like a bottle and it says pickleback on it. Like pour me an actual pickleback chaser out of a fucking pickle jar and like don't pussy about it. Like give me the fucking pickle juice. I love pickles. Okay. If you want to buy Faye a drink, please do. If I'm with her and she's picking the drinks, stick to the iguana. Wait till she's alone. No pickles. <laughs> yeah. Keep Suzette out of these drinks. <laughs> Keep these drinks out of Suzette. Yeah, that part. <laughs> yeah. It goes both ways, it shows. People have seen. Someone's sloppy. Um, if someone comes up and they want to buy us drinks, what are we drinking? Malibu pineapple with a splash of grenadine. It's actually funny enough, I work at Splash Modesto. Yeah. Uh, outside of drag, obviously. Um, and and in drag well now yeah actually yeah, next I'm, sunday i will be there performing yes. at splash Modesto. i totally forgot about Debut. that and on the 30th as well for their halloween brunch or Debut. halloween dinner and drag shows um but uh now there are a couple of people that will go up and ask like hey can you give me like can you give me the gavin drink or like i want i want gavin's drink and people know, like my my man, my boss has to ask me now. He's like, "What the hell is it again?" He's like, "I always forget it every single time." And I'm like, "It's Malibu pineapple with a splash of Are you grenadine." Talking about Greg? Yes. Yeah, of course, Greg. Greg. He's, not, he's not watching the show, but Greg, like Malibu pineapple splash of grenadine. He always wants to go. Uh, he always wants to go like. Um, Let's put orange juice in it. Like, yeah, sunrise. He always wants to make it a sunrise because then right. he'll go like light rum, dark rum, All like right. orange juice, pineapple. I apologize, Greg. You're forgiven, but. Like, but mine's more simple, simple. and tone. Simple. Exactly. It's straight to the point. And that's my go-go juice. Like, I got hooked on that at, um, at the Eves of Paradise. I walk around at brunch with my, my, we call it a, a, a what do we call it? A slutty princess. Mm-hmm. And, but it's the big glass. Everyone sees, like, my huge, I don't think you saw it today because I wasn't hosting. No. It, you'll see on the 25th. It's, it's actually a vase <laughs> um i can't wait and and everyone's like i want what she has and no one ever thinks to just say and i always tell them just like they're like i, I don't know how to get it i'm like just say you want what suzette has except they can't have it i'm the only one that can have the slutty princess so yeah it's like you can ask for it yeah but you don't get it uh very important question toilet paper over or under over oh Thank my you. god my roommate tried to do the fucking under thing and mm -hmm. i almost suffocated him with a pillow you know what's worse though <laughs> in 26 episodes i've asked so many people this question and i don't i don't like you if you're an under <laughs> but i don't can't stand you if you're averse yeah like if you oh, just don't, don't care, care yes what's like, wrong with how do you, you not care the dis organization like what kind of like chaos are you allowing this universe to the only one that, that is acceptable when they don't care is um like oh i don't put it on a roll i just take, grab it off of the floor of the back of the you set it on like the i don't like, like it but like a, like i just don't know how you can have a roll and just do it differently all the time that's so like i, I hate that like just put, I, especially like when there's a toilet paper roll like a toilet paper holder like right there and people still put it on like a side table or in the goddamn counter. I'm I mean, like, if it's their house, you do what you want. But I was like, be a normal human being and it put it where it belongs. Or use a bidet and don't use toilet paper. I've if, gotten the answer. Oh, I need to get a bidet. I mean, we, like, just because I'm lonely. That would be my platform <laughs> if I was running for president. Bidet for every house. Bidet. <laughs> yes. I would lit. I would vote for you. Bidets. Biden for bidets. Biden for bidets. He's missing out. <laughs> um, who is your favorite drag queen? Uh, you. <laughs> no yeah yeah you're one of my favorites oh my god thank you you're welcome absolutely okay i'm teary now yeah don't cry. um who is your favorite drag king oh def uh, uh definitely clive definitely clive 
Oh, hey, Clive. Like, Landon Sider comes in at, like, a close second, but, like, he's, like, like, Dragula. But, like, honestly, Clive is, I think he's so, I think he's so clever. I really do. And I think that we have so much more to see from Clive that we haven't seen yet. And I'm so excited for the next steps. I'm going to be really corny. Mm -hmm. and, and I hope Apple Adams doesn't mind me making this corny, corny joke. But, hey, Clive, we're her favorites, so let's make sparks. Yeah, because Clive made sparks today. Get it. With his crotch. Okay. <laughs> um, that's it. Um, the last one is, um, what are you most excited to do when you can – all the restrictions are lifted. We have a new normal or our old normal. We just have a normal to go back to or to get to. What are you excited for? Disneyland. Oh my God, am I so ready for Disneyland. I'm an annual pass holder and get this. I went for Valentine's Day and I got an annual pass. And then COVID happened. I'm like, this could not have been the worst. It could not have been more ill-timed ever, ever. It's just burning a hole in my wallet, and I look at it every now and then. And They were supposed to refund. Oh, no, no, no. They stopped payments, of course, like because like, they have a monthly payment program that you can possibly be on. But, like, yeah, okay. they, 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 they haven't been charging. But it's like it's still the card, the physical card is still in my wallet, I so see. I have to look at it all the time and know that, like, Anaheim is literally a six and a half hour drive. And if I had like days off, I would just go down to Disneyland just on like a random Tuesday just to be able to eat churros and go on Splash Mountain in the middle of June. I love Splash Mountain. Oh my. I used to hate it. I used to absolutely hate it because my ex used to like, my ex ruined a lot of things, but like whatever. They I do. digress. But like they do that, right? Yeah. It's crazy. But um, he forced me to go on it. And eventually like I just, I'm like, okay, are we going on Splash Mountain today? Like, is that, is that what we're doing? I was like, I still won't go on that Grizzly River Rapid Run, though, in California Adventure, because, like, I enjoy being a little wet. Like, my my shoes and my socks and, like, my bag and, like, maybe the bottom of my pants because of Splash Mountain because of all the stuff coming up over, and like, the sides. And if Max is around your panties, go on. Yeah, exactly. Oh. <laughs> Anyways, um, only with the sparks, though, because Apple Adams will... We respect Apple Adams. Yes, absolutely. Yes. From one bald queen to another bald queen, I respect you. But, like... Yeah, I, I am. We can that, look. We can look. That and dancing. Going yes. back to being able to dance, like at working at a bar and like having it just be like outdoor patio dining at the moment is great because we're able to socialize. Sit like, at the tables. Yeah. But, like there's something about like seeing people just like dance, like loving dance in general, like being a dancer. Like I guess if you can call me that. Um. I just I don't know. Same. I just I just miss people being able to like move and like if you're like grinding dirty up on each other there's nothing I love more than like a shit-faced lesbian couple that's literally about to fuck on the dance floor like and it happens all the time so I miss shit like that like I really do so Disneyland and dancing I yes to both of those <laughs> I love Disneyland I have a story for you when we're done with the show okay um about disney brunch and then also um dancing you know my secret people don't yes me, but oh love, my god i love dancing people uh no don't tell them it's <laughs> okay it's mom's, secret. mom's no, the word it'll it'll i'm in a box mm -hmm. I, i'm i'm uh, when I come out of the box, it's not, it's not a today on national coming out day. Um, <laughs> Faye, thank you. I love you. Thank Congratulations. You. I love you too. Thank you. On your win. Thank you. I'm so happy for you. Uh, if I have any right to say I'm proud of you, I am. Thank you. No, it means a lot. Um, normally I'd sign off. Um, but we always end the show with our, our final person. Would you like to join me? Sure. In interviewing David Shapiro? Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank oh. you for coming, and your information has been below you um, the entire show. So if anyone wants to send you coin, they can send it to you there. Ooh. They can follow you on Instagram. They can see cool pictures of your drag. Oh, yeah. And, like, some not so cool. Actually, no. They're cool now. I, I brushed it up a little bit. I fixed everything. Oh, okay. Yeah. So check it out. <laughs> um, Faye Menon, I love you. Thank you. I love you too. Susette. Please come Thank back you. sometime. Oh, absolutely. Anytime you'll have me. Okay, but don't leave because we're going to interview David together. Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, <laughs> Jesse, are we ready? Okay. 
Um, hey everyone, uh, as always, we're ending the show with um, actor, comic, producer, whatever he's failing at today, um, David Shapiro. Hey David, can you hear me? Hey Suzette. Oh, hey, Faye Menon. Uh, congratulations on your win today of the competition um, Into the Draglands. Thank Congrats. you. Thank, thank you, David. So cool. I really appreciate that. Very much so. So, David, this has been a weird two weeks. Yeah. Um, yeah, you guest hosted for me uh, two weeks ago, and then and then last week uh, we did the live show. You're at welcome. Uh, thank you, yeah, for guest hosting. <laughs> yeah. Um, you didn't make it on screen, though, last week. No. No, I didn't make it on screen, and I was bummed, too, um, because you got roasted uh, on your show, and I wanted to... I wanted to be part, I mean, I wanted to, yeah, I wanted to be part of it. The <laughs> library was open on you. Uh, it wasn't like, that bad. whoa. Yeah, it wasn't that bad. Uh, I don't know. Hey, Faye. Yeah? Can you feel the heat coming from Suzette's burns a uh, week that, later? That's just, that's just the, the heated pussy, I'm assuming. <laughs> so... Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> she got David. She got red for her hair. She got red for her performance that day, and then other performances, uh, both performances that day. Um, kind of weird. The only Were thing they? she didn't get red for the like Suzette. The only thing you didn't get red for was your looks. That's because there's nothing to read about this. <laughs> sure, boo. Oh. You tell that to yourself. You said before that I was pretty. I said you were prettier than my ex-wife, is what I said. And that's true. That tracks. Oh, well. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, David, so what do you want to talk I about? So I actually, because you have Faye there, I thought I'd take advantage and ask her a couple questions. Okay. Um, because she is a competition, uh, a competition winner. Um, so first off, uh, Faye. Mm-hmm. Hi. Um, hi. I wanted to ask you, every time I enter a competition, uh, I come in, like, last or next to last, right? Like, comedy competition, any kind of competition, really. Okay. Should I just stop competing in competitions and just perform in regular shows? Or should I continue to compete in competitions even though I keep coming in last and it breaks my tiny heart? Like, what's your advice on that as a, as a show winner? Uh, Personally, like from being a show winner and then also a show loser plenty of times prior to that, um, I think competitions can bring out the best and the worst in people, but I think it brings out the best within yourself also. Like I think people need to continue to be pushing themselves. And I think competitions are a really, really great way to actually see where you are creative wise. Like and push yourself outside of that really. And you grow from it. Yeah. Yeah. You expand. So when, when you expand. <laughs> so when you, when you, what keeps you going when you, when you lose? Uh, weed. Lots of weed and crying. So <laughs> coping mechanisms. Yes. Coping mechanisms. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then what, what inspires you to do it to enter again? I, I, proving it, I guess, to myself more than anybody like that. Like, you know what? Maybe this time. Maybe this time. So it, it, it's always a great hopeful thing to kind of like hang on to. Do you try different competitions or the same one? Um, I would say go for different <clears throat> ones. Mm -hmm. Honestly, try out a different competition. Because like if, if, the, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. But like you don't necessarily have to keep going down the same road. Oh, see, I think that's where I'd get stuck. Because I'd be like, want, I'd want to conquer that hill. Almost like a level in a video game. I think that might be a good idea, though. That, that That's probably, like, that would be a really good way of doing it. Like, if you have the opportunity to get back in that same competition, go for it. Right on. So you definitely recommend competitions? Yes and no. I okay. cannot, ni I can neither confirm nor deny that. <laughs> in, in Before today, you recommended competitions? Yes. Okay. But after today, girl, run. Huh. Run. <laughs> well, that's what we'd all say to all the performers. But <laughs> got it. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for the. Um, thank you for that advice. Yeah, no problem. Um, about everything there. Um, second question. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is out there. Okay. Um. Like. 
you get you you decided to start performing in drag like can anyone perform in drag can straight boys perform in drag uh it's just a thought but i couldn't be worse than suzette Uh-oh. right like i i that's like the low bar um so i guess i was wondering what advice you would give to anyone who might want to start drag um and like could i do it yeah i i think drag again like we touched base on earlier like in the sec like it, drag is for everybody it is transcendent of gender identity and sexuality um just because you're a straight male and that's what you identify as this cisgender straight male does not mean that you are negated from being able to explore the wonderful world that is drag honestly like i think i think everybody should just at least put on a wig and some lashes and everybody deserves to feel fabulous at least once in their life so or it doesn't have to be a wig and lashes you can i mean because i don't do drag kings and i know drag kings but i don't do they wear lashes oh no some do some do some push that gender boundary as well which i live for always i'm always about pushing that gender boundary but um even even drag kings because like there's bio kings definitely or like a not a fab i guess it's it would be an a mab king yeah a mab because there's like a fab queens which is which assigned is female assigned at birth. Fe- yeah and assigned male at birth because like is the opposite yeah so it drag in general is just like an over exaggeration and a blurring of the gender lines all at the same time so i think it's for everybody yeah i think that's that's the umbrella is the, is the exaggeration and blurring of gender lines because mm-hmm. you can you can be a bearded queen Oh, I tried that. You, you can be a uh, a, a dainty king. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can you can be basic. <laughs> you can be spooky ookie kooky. You don't have to sub. You don't have to subscribe to one form of. Whoa. Okay. Uh, okay. Faye, thank you so much uh, for That's rude. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> all your advice. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um. Suzette. Yeah? Rude you disappoint boy. me every time. Oh my god, I hate you. <laughs> every time. I hate you so much. And you're rude. And you interrupted Faye. <laughs> well, uh, bye, ladies. Bye. bye. Bye, David. He's the worst. I should, not, I should just switch Jews. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got the sexy one that was from earlier. I I might have to make a trade. He's a cutie. Is that a program switch a Jew? <laughs> um, I've never heard of that. I mean, I mean there might be. I mean, there's a, there might be an app for that. I'm gonna stop before I get canceled. Sorry. Yep. Um. Yeah. <laughs> uh. So much has happened to their people. Um. <laughs> okay, this president. Bye. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Hey, Faye, thanks for coming on today. Thank you, Suzette. Um. And uh, viewers, I hope you enjoyed today's show. A uh, little bit different. Uh, thank you for watching. Next week we have Ellis Rodriguez. Thank you as always to Jesse and Stab. And we'll see you next week on October 18th at 5.03 p.m.
Say. Yeah.